Okay, good morning, uh, everyone. I think it's time we can uh, kick off this morning's webinar. So I should begin with an introduction. I'm Alan Barrett. I'm the director uh, of the SRI, and it is a great pleasure to welcome everybody to uh, this morning's webinar on the, uh, the application of ethical principles for the design of just transition policies. And uh, so delighted to say, although the ESRI is uh, hosting the event uh, this morning, we've got a fantastic representation across our, a range of uh, our partner institutes. Uh, so later this morning, you'll be hearing from colleagues from UCC, TCD, uh, UCD, DCU, um, on Tashka and also the Department of Environment, Climate and Communication. So we've got a very uh, good lineup and so it's great to be joined uh, by so many of our, our colleagues and partners uh, from across uh, the country. Uh, I'm just going to give a, a, a very brief reflection uh, before I sort of hand over for the, the main purpose uh, of, of the day. And I suppose in, in truth, my, my main reflection uh, focuses around the inclusion of the word ethical uh, in, in the title. I'm almost embarrassed to say this. Uh, but very often when I'm opening ESRI uh, conferences, I can sort of uh, look back on, on precedents and talk about maybe some of the issues that we were discussing at these sort of events 5, 10, uh, 15 years ago. And obviously we've been talking about climate uh, for very many years. Uh, but, you know, under the umbrella of, a, you know, a, a, a title uh, talking about ethical principles, we, we haven't uh, done that as much. And uh, when I was sort of scrolling across then the, the titles of the individual sessions, uh, terms such as legal, political, educational and moral philosophy, uh, crop up. And again, I was thinking, my God, we, we probably haven't really, uh, you know, discussed things uh, under those sort of headings. Um, and that led me to, to, to wonder, well, why, why has that been the case? Um, and uh, I suppose a, a confessional moment here, if I, if I can put it like, like that, um, I think there's no doubt economics um, over time uh, became a, a, a very technical uh, subject. Okay, not all economists, uh, let, let's be clear about this, uh, but nevertheless, if you look at sort of particularly work done at graduate schools and the sort of the, the scientific drivers uh, of the discipline, uh, true theory, um, ma mathematics was absolutely dominant. Uh, and even on the empirical side, the, the, the greater sort of concentration on econometrics and ever more sophisticated econometrics, I think meant that the subject was driven in a, in a very technical role uh, across both, both theory and, and applied uh, measures. And that was very much a departure uh, with the way economics had been thought about, uh, thought and sort of, you know, research and conducted for, for many, many years. But it's almost as if in some ways the, the, the subject sort of drove itself uh, into a, a technical uh, cul-de-sac. Uh, at, at some levels then, the, the natural collaborations came up with other uh, highly technical people, be it sort of in engineering or physics or whatever like that. So I, I I think to, to a great extent, some of the, the broader issues um, that we're going to be discussing today, economists may have just distanced them, themselves a little bit from these sort of things. And I think that's terribly, terribly uh, unfortunate. Luckily, within the SRI, uh, although, you know, obviously we're primarily a, a group of economists, we've always had the strong uh, impact of sociology uh, colleagues, uh, which I think has, has broadened thinking. And then uh, more recently, our psychology colleagues and behavioral sciences, I think, have, have broadened our thinking. But nevertheless, I think today is a sort of a, a good illustration of what we, we need to be doing more often, uh, which is talking about our type of work, uh, but, but, but joined up uh, with, with the work of the group of people uh, that we've assembled uh, here today. I think it's, it's good across the subject in general, uh, but I think particularly when you come across the issue of climate change and the sort of, you know, the range of issues that arise, uh, this broader sort of consideration of the issues today, I think is really, really appropriate. And I think it's very uh, exciting. And uh, hopefully in, in some sense, although as I said earlier on, this is the, the first time uh, in a long time, at least, that uh, words as, you, as ethical have appeared uh, in, in our titles. Uh, hopefully, th this is something that we'll, uh, we'll be carrying on with. So I think it's going to be a very good and interesting morning. I do want to congratulate uh, my colleague, Miguel Angel Guevara, uh, who put together uh, today's uh, seminar or webinar. Uh, Miguel, as many of you know, is working diligently on these issues for a, a very, very long time. Uh, but as I said, I think it's absolutely wonderful that he's brought this broader group together uh, to discuss the issues uh, at hand. Uh, 
So I'm very much looking forward to the, the, the morning. Uh, I think you will all be as well. Uh, although it's a webinar, uh, I know we'll be encouraging people to submit questions through the Q&A function, uh, but also people should feel free to use the chat function as well and to have a good engagement uh, on, on that platform. Um, so with that, I think my only other duty is uh, to hand over the, the, uh, the chair to Keen Mintz Wu. And I think Keen, you'll be uh, taking us through the first session. So with that, over to you. Thanks so much, Alan. And, and thanks again um, to everyone for joining and to Miguel uh, Angel Tobar again for, for putting this uh, very far reaching panel uh, together, this, this event together. And I want to echo Alan in saying, um, I do hope that this is the start of um, an interesting series of discussions um, that will continue. So uh, my name is Kian Mintz Wu. Uh, I'm a lecturer at University College Cork, and I'm affiliated with the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis uh, in Austria as well. And I'm very pleased to be chairing uh, the first session. So um, the first session will be three talks, each of about 20 minutes. Um, after which there'll be the chance for Q&A. During the talks, please feel free to um, uh, put comments into the Q&A. Uh, the Q&A is open for questions and we encourage questions as we're going through, uh, but of course that Q&A will be handled after each of the talks, which will run concurrently. So I'll introduce the three speakers now, and then we'll give the three uh, talks about 20 minutes each, and then we'll have a discussion, a space for Q&A. So first we have uh, Dr. Orla Kelleher, uh, Dr. Orla Kelleher is currently a teaching assistant at the University of Limerick School of Law uh, and an incoming postdoctoral researcher at DCU Center for Climate and Society starting July 2022. Uh, Orla is a non-practicing barrister having been called to the Irish Bar in 2020 uh, and her research links climate, environmental and human rights law. Uh, following Dr. Kelleher is Dr. Susan Murphy. Dr. Susan Murphy is a lecturer in international development practice with the Department of Geography at Trinity. Uh, most importantly for us, she's the lead researcher for a climate justice and development research group. Uh, she wrote a book in 2016, uh, Responsibility in an Interconnected World, which links uh, dis uh, development and climate um, justice issues. Uh, and she's had many, many, many titles, but just for a small sample, uh, Susan is a member of the Department for Foreign Affairs Audit Committee and has served uh, chair of the board of trustees for Oxfam Ireland. And finally, uh, we're going to have uh, Lucas uh, Shivan. Um, uh, Lucas is a, a, a senior officer with Anne Tashki, working on the Green Schools Travel Program since 2014. Uh, as a travel officer, he encourages sustainable transport and teaches about climate change in County Mayo. He also delivers educational programs to schools for the Sustainability Energy Authority of Ireland. He is a published author in Poland and an editor of a Polish philosophy magazine. His enterprise, Creative Together, connects communities through art, music, and philosophy. And he runs a successful Philosopher's Hat Club, uh, engaging the public in philosophical and ethical inquiry. Um, as a philosopher with a hat, I'm very pleased to hear that. So uh, let me uh, hand it over to our first speaker, uh, Dr. Orla Kelleher. Um, and so again, that'll be 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll go right into the next session. Um, and I'll, I'll break in to give a quick um, warning when it's 17 minutes. Thanks very much. Thanks, Keen, for the lovely introduction. And uh, thanks again to Miguel for organizing such a great event and for inviting me along to speak. So my presentation today is based on a paper I'm currently co-authoring with uh, Dr. Andrew Jackson on Ireland's Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Amendment Act from 2021, which we're hoping to publish in the coming months. And really, it's an early draft of um, some of my part of that paper. So I'm excited uh, to, to get to share some of it with you today. So in terms of what I want to do with my, um, with my 20 minutes, so I'm going to give you first a quick overview of climate change and the law. So some of you may be wondering what on earth do lawyers have to do with climate change? Uh, so our contribution is very much around how we regulate uh, emission reductions and adaptation. So in that vein, I'm going to talk a little bit about Climate Change Act and Ireland's Climate Change Act in particular. Then I'm going to move on and talk about the concepts of uh, climate justice and just transition. So I'm going to look at how these concepts are framed in academic discourse. Um, I'm then going to look at how, I suppose, the, both these concepts are very much root, rooted in 
grass, grassroots activism. So I'm going to look at sort of how, um, how they're articulated in those kinds of circles before moving on to look at how they have been knitted into the international uh, climate um, law framework. I'm then going to move and talk a little bit from moving from that kind of big international perspective down to the domestic level and look at how both concepts climate justice and just transition have actually been incorporated into our national law the climate action and low carbon development amendment act and then i'm going to conclude with a few um reform proposals which i see as being quite important so um Kicking off then, uh, climate change acts are um, their national framework, um, legislative frameworks that are usually put in place by state legislatures for the purpose of tackling climate change in um, uh, in, in an overarching or broadly strategic manner. So the big emphasis is on this um, this kind of strategic system-wide approach to tackling uh, emissions or adaptation. So Ireland enacted its first uh, Climate Change Act in 2015, the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Act, and amended that legislation just six years later um, with the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Amendment Act. So in terms of the advantages to these kinds of pieces of legislation, they serve a very important purpose in creating certainty and clarity for all actors, be it individuals, companies um, uh, go governments um, about the future direction of travel travel for decarbonization and um, they're also a way of meaningfully making a contribution towards the temperature goals of the the Paris agreement and probably most important of all they serve a very important purpose um, preventing I suppose they're, they're, they're more difficult to revise than a piece of uh, a soft policy document so that that significance of not being able to roll back very easy is, is a very important feature of climate change acts so in terms of uh climate justice and uh just transition i think it's um important before I maybe get into talking about the um the kind of nitty-gritty of both of these concepts to, to to note that climate justice and just transition actually don't tend to feature particularly prominently in um climate change acts or in the literature that discusses them so i think for two reasons it's really important that we do actually start to foreground discussions of climate justice and just transition in our discussions of climate change acts one is from a domestic perspective both concepts featured very prominently in the legislative process um, and in the debates that led to the 2021 act but also i think it responds to um, an urgent need that uh, scholars in the global south have been calling for for a long time to decolonize climate and part of that is around um, knowledge production and epistemological framings and so i think um, kind of foregrounding discussions of climate justice and just transition is a really important feature of that. So moving on to talk about what climate uh, justice is all about. So it's primarily concerned with exposing uneven responsibility for climate change. So many on the call already will know that it's wealthy countries and wealthy individuals that have disproportionately contributed to the problem of climate change, both historically and to the present day with our current emissions. Um, but also th these cohorts um, tend to be that have the least incentive to act in the short term because of our relative insulation from the worst impacts of climate change right now. Um, but climate justice is also about contesting the unequal distribution of impacts. So um, poorer countries and poorer people who have contributed least to the problem of uh, climate change and have the least adaptive capacity are already being most harmed. But I suppose under business as usual, they, 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 these impacts will become worse and they will suffer the most acutely. But there's also recognition in climate justice um, discourse uh, that uh, the the response measures can um, can exacerbate or at least replicate existing inequalities. So uh, maybe a good international example of that is if developed countries at this point in time decide to put off rapid emission reductions in the short term, that is going to mean we will have to rely on um, negative emissions technologies and vast deployment of ne negative emissions technologies in future. And that is ultimately pushing bur the burden uh, onto um, future generations, but 
uh, most likely uh, the global south as well. So it's a recognition of this um, unequal burden when it comes to tackling climate change. So I suppose the grassroots um, articulations of climate justice have emerged over the years kind of in tandem with the uh, UNFCCC and COP processes um, through a series of declarations. And they've made very concrete demands around leaving fossil fuels in the ground, financial and technology transfer from global south to um, from global north to global south countries in recognition of ecological debt. So it's very much a recognition that having disproportionately used up our share of um, the atmospheric sink, uh, uh, sink that developed countries now owe reparations ultimately to uh, countries in the global south. Um, it also calls for food and land sovereignty for vulnerable communities, a controversial one that I'm in front of economists today, but a rejecting or at least very much a challenging of purely market based uh, solutions as a silver bullet or panacea. Um, and similarly with technology solutions. So I suppose it's, it's been quite critical or at least challenging of things like um, of complete reliance on carbon markets or negative emissions technologies as a kind of quick fix solution to tackling the climate crisis and also a recognition um, of a set of legal rights for other species um, and ecosystems. So moving on then to how these concepts have been integrated into international climate law. So the Paris Agreement was the first uh, international uh, climate treaty to um, expressly recognize climate justice. It did it in the preambular text rather than the operative text. So um, it, it's uh, kind of how we interpret the other obligations is informed by the, the preamble. But the language in that preamble is fairly weak. Uh, it's noting the importance of climate justice for some. However, I think it's important to emphasize that since the inception of the UNFCCC right through to uh, the Paris Agreement, and um, the guiding principles of uh, international climate law very much um, are iterations and give expression to the concept of climate justice. So things like equity, common but differentiated responsibility, developed country leadership, these guiding principles are meant to inform how we go about um, preparing our nationally determined contributions and how we ultimately contribute to the temperature goals of the Paris Agreement. So, um, Moving on to talk about uh, just transition. So again, many people on the call will probably be aware of this already, but just transition has its roots in uh, the North American trade union movement from the 1970s. In the scholarship, there's a recognition of narrow and broader definitions. So a narrow definition focuses very much on the need for state supports uh, for workers and communities that stand to lose their job uh, because of the phasing out of uh, fossil fuels. The broader definition then calls for justice, not just for workers, but a broader constituency that em uh, and emphasizes the importance of not continuing to sacrifice the, the well-being of vulnerable groups for the sake of advantaging small uh, a small privileged minority and recognizing that that has been quite commonplace um, in our fossil fuel based societies so i think it's important to stress that broader definition it's not about ignoring the need for decent jobs and strong baseline protections for uh, fossil fuel workers in their communities but it rather sees a uh, just transition as being those wins and much more and um, also, some people may be starting to question, you know, are climate justice and just transition not the same thing then? They are closely connected uh, concepts, but I think in Ireland, at least, there's generally an understanding that just transition maybe has more of a resonance for national level policies, whereas climate justice um, is often seen to have maybe a bit more of an international focus. And I'm drawing that uh, from a really excellent report um, authored by Saif O'Neill, who's on the call here. Um, it was a report on environmental justice Justice in Ireland commissioned by or prepared by the CLM and DC. So anyone interested in this topic, it's um, essential reading. So definitely go and check it out. So in terms of um, how these concepts like just transition have been integrated into the international climate regime then um, and international law more broadly, um, the 20, in 2015, you had the International Labour Organization's guidelines on just transition. 
a few months later uh, with the Paris Agreement, you had a recognition in the preamble of the imperative of a just transition. And that didn't stop with Paris. Um, in uh, 2018, you had the Celestia Declaration um, on Just Transition again at COP24, to which Ireland is also a signatory. So both concepts of just transition and uh, climate justice are deeply embedded in the international uh, climate regime. So moving, I suppose, from that big international picture to um, the domestic picture and how climate uh, justice has been integrated into Irish law. So um, climate justice actually did feature under the 2015 Climate Change Act. Um, it was um, it was left undefined as a concept and was incorporated through weak um, have regard to obligations. So the government had to, when uh, preparing and adopting climate policies, like the then National Mitigation Plan, had to have regard to a series of criteria, including climate justice. So that has been kind of uh, carried over into the 2021 Act. So climate justice is again left undefined um, and is incorporated through quite weak have regard to obligations. So the actual requirement is that in preparing and approving annual climate action plans and national long-term climate action strategies which sadly we actually don't have published yet so we kind of urgently need to see that a uh, national long-term climate action strategy and um, to kind of progress with um so uh, our climate action but um the government and ministers have to have regard to climate justice but it's amongst a list of 17 other criteria so it would be my view that it's not particularly um good at foregrounding climate justice and making it a central organizing principle when it's sort of um in that big long list of, of criteria similarly there's an obligation on the climate change advisory council to have regard to uh, climate uh, justice in preparing carbon budgets so the 2021 Act, because it's quite new, hasn't really been uh, subject to much judicial interpretation yet. The 2015 Act has been subject to a little bit of litigation and probably the example most people would be aware of is the Friends of the Irish Environment and Government of Ireland case, also known as Climate Case Ireland. So in that case, um, I suppose it was an opportunity really to see how these have regard to obligations play out. So um, in that case, the government was actually in a position to, to, to be able to argue that uh, regard was had to all the statutory criteria, including climate justice, because in, in this instance, there is actually, or there was a reference to uh, common but differentiated responsibilities in the national mitigation plan. Now, I suppose, to my mind, the difficulty with that was this is a national mitigation plan for a wealthy developed countries with very, very high per capita emissions. And yet it was a plan that was going to allow emissions or over the lifetime of that plan, emissions would continue to rise. So I think the lesson from that is that have regard to obligations because they're not obligations of strict compliance. They're not maybe the most effective at ensuring that governments meaningfully take uh, climate justice into account when setting uh, climate policy. So in terms of how just transition has been incorporated into um, the 2021 Act, so that's, that was a first, it wasn't integrated into the 2015 Act. The obligation like with climate justice is uh, that in preparing and approving uh, climate policies like the annual climate action plan and national long-term climate act action strategy, that government has to have regard to the requirement for a just transition to a carbon neutral um, economy. But again, it's kind of mixed in there among 17 other criteria, which arguably some of them might even be seen to be a little bit contradictory. So climate justice is or uh, just transition rather is defined, but in relatively weak terms. So uh, the language is endeavouring insofar as practicable. So again, very qualified language there to maximise employment opportunities and to support persons and communities that may be negatively affected by the transition. So I don't take any objection to that second part of the definition, but I think the first part, the maximising employment opportunities, to my mind, um, that definition is ignoring a central tenant a uh, tenet of climate uh, uh, or just transition rather, which is the creation of decent work. So decent work is well defined by the International Labour Organization as being organized around fair income, secure and safe working conditions, equal opportunities, uh, social protection, personal development, and where workers are free to express concerns and to organize. I think maybe the, the difficulty um, with the definition is that it missed out on that opportunity to foreground this really important idea of just transition, which is that any jobs that are replacing fossil fuel jobs have to be of an equal, if not better, um, quality. 
and also the act disappointingly missed out on an opportunity to to mention or refer to or build on the notion of representative and participatory social dialogue which is another key dimension of the just transition so how could we do it better? I think a good starting point would be uh, to look at um, much stronger definitions. So we could, for example, and this was suggested during the legislative process, have a stronger definition of climate justice based on the Scottish Climate Act, which is also a second generation act, but um, it kind of goes a little bit further in defining just transition and climate justice. So it could be defined as the importance of and taking action to reduce emissions and to adapt to the effects of climate. That We support people who are most affected by climate change, but have done uh, the least to cause it and are um, uh, least equipped to adapt to its effects and addresses inequality. And similarly, a definition for just transition, which again had been recommended by the Joint Oireachtas Committee, so it had cross-party support and it was based on a submission by the International Labour Organization that it, it, it could mean a transition to that ensures economic, environmental and social consequences of the ecological transformation of economies and society are managed in a way that maximizes the opportunities of decent work for all, reduces inequalities, promotes social justice, supports industries, workers and communities negatively affected and is based on social uh, effective social dialogue. So again, emphasizing those two really important features of the just transition, the, the importance of decent work and effective social dialogue. So I see those um, stronger definitions as being really, really important, but by themselves, they are not enough. Um, they also need to be accompanied by strong um, legal obligations. So um, an idea for what those could look like. And again, these ideas did surface um, in the legislative process and um, during the pre-legislative scrutiny. So one idea would be uh, to replace the have regard to obligations with something a lot stronger. Uh, so in preparing and approving climate policies and carbon budgets, the minister the minister and government shall act in a manner consistent with climate justice and just transition. So again, that had actually been recommended by the Joint Oireachtas Committee. So there was cross-party uh, support for, for these kinds of measures. Um, an alternative and even maybe a complementary approach would be uh, to include a, a duty to explain uh, how climate justice is being advanced and how just transition is being taken into account in the setting of climate policies, which would be a similar approach to that taken by the uh, Scottish Climate Act. And that had been recommended by um, uh, by uh, advocacy groups and scholars uh, during the um, during the, the pre-legislative scrutiny as well. And I think that duty to explain could actually have been really uh, well integrated throughout the Act. And that kind of came through in the International Labour Organization's uh, recommendations as well, that the Climate Change Advisory Council's annual review and periodic review could also include a climate justice and just transition Last assessment. Last minute and a half. Oh, yeah. Um, and um, similarly, local authority plans could similarly um, include a climate justice and just uh, transition uh, considerations as well. So moving uh, maybe a little bit broader to other measures from a legal perspective that would um, effectively operationalise climate justice and just transition in Ireland, I think... Um, a very important one is actually starting to really center uh, fair share contributions in our in our discussion. So part of that is actually looking again at our decarbonization target and um, reviewing it so it's based on equity. So that uh, actually looks like decarbonization by as early as uh, by twenty the early twenty thirties. Other countries have started to do similar. Finland is a good uh, recent example of that. And um, stronger legislative measures to keep fossil fuels in the ground. Uh, commit to make a fair share contribution to climate finance. So Ireland has done quite well historically on this, but really needs to scale up the, the quantity of um, uh, climate finance, looking at constitutionalising a right to a healthy environment and safe climate, but also looking at constitutional duties towards future generations and non-humans. And then from the just transition side of things, looking at establishing a just transition uh, commission adequately resourced with a broad remit that would also look at uh, the transitions for agriculture Culture, and importantly, scaling up community owned uh, energy projects as a form of uh, transformative uh, just transition rather than just maybe a status quo approach. So I will leave it there and I'm looking forward to any questions and the discussions to, to follow. So thank you for listening. 
thanks so much. So um, I'll pass it along to Susan Murphy. And I'm going to put a link to the program in the chat in case anyone needs that. Thanks. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be with you uh, here today. I want to say um, congratulations to Orla. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, and the, the research I'm going to share with you this morning actually moves from the, I suppose, the opposite perspective. It moves from the ground up. Um, and so I'm going to share a project with you on just transitions frames and looking at matters of recognition, representation and distribution in the Irish beef farming sector in particular. So I think it presents a really nice balance. Before I get going, I do want to say an enormous thank you to, uh, Miguel, Ange uh, to Miguel Angel Tovar um, and the organizers of this event uh, for inviting me to participate. I really am honored. Um, and I'm delighted to share with you uh, the results of research project that I've been working on with a couple of colleagues over the last couple of years. Uh, that's Dr. Sheila Cannon, she's a professor in social uh, entrepreneurship and social innovation in uh, Trinity College School of Business and Lindsay Walsh. Uh, Lindsay Walsh is an alumna of the Masters in Development Practice uh, and she's the current climate policy uh, researcher with Oxfam in GB and she's focusing specifically now around the areas of loss and damage. But I just want to begin with um, I'd like to take you back if I could uh, to a wet cold day in November 2019 when small bee farmers from all over Ireland travelled to Dublin to blockade the main roads with their tractors. This protest was not organised uh, or officially sanctioned through the main representative body, the Irish Farmers Association. And it, indeed, it seemed to take everyone by surprise, government and IFA. The farmers' placards regularly read, uh, no carbon tax, and it takes uh, twice the amount of carbon to produce a vegan burger than a beef burger. Clearly, there's a very strong sentiment that environmental policies are threatening. And this is something that we need to give serious consideration to in light of the government's pledge to reduce uh, agricultural emissions over the coming years and plans to transition the sector to sustainable pathways and as these uh, pathways are emerging. But there's strong indicators that the sector uh, is already experiencing unplanned change, disruption and small scale conflict. And this is where our study began. We wanted to understand why these protests were unfolding in the way that they were, and what can we learn from these protests that can inform planning for a just transition of the beef sector in Ireland. As high income countries with established political constituencies, embedded institutions, uh, legacy systems, invest, uh, and very well established vested interests and dominant actors, as these countries transition from unsustainable to sustainable economic systems, the just transition approach is emerging as a critical tool for building social legitimacy necessary to implement uh, climate adaptation and mitigation policies. In both the Irish and the European context, the language of just transition features very heavily in climate action plans and economic policy materials. Uh, in deliberations and negotiations with workers and communities concerning the energy transition from peat extraction to bog restoration in the indigenous sector, it's been particularly dominant. And in 2021, it emerged as a dominant feature in Ireland's climate action plan, which outlines pathways for transitioning all sectors across the economy. This document notes that the development of plans to manage uh, it, it notes the development of plans to manage the sustainable environmental footprint of the beef and dairy sectors will be central to the achievement of Ireland's climate targets. However, it provides little insight into how a just transition would or could be operationalized in this sector. And it also seems to a certain degree to be somewhat abstracted from reality. Transitions do not occur on a blank canvas. They're enacted within specifiable spaces and places with policies and practices refracting through pre-existing power dynamics and asymmetries, social relations and hierarchies, and deeply embedded structural inequalities. For a transition to be just, it must be cognizant of the places and spaces within which it's being applied and ensure that it does not cause greater harm as it alters the economic, cultural and environmental and social fabric of communities and risk leaving pockets of communities behind. So in, if we look at bee farming in Ireland, and I've shared with you now just a timeline um, of protests, and this is the period around which we conducted our research. And we know that bee farming in Ireland is, in, is has experienced and is experiencing challenging times with a range of different pressures acting upon it from within social, political, economic, and environmental spheres. 
Beef farmers are struggling economically, uh, relying very heavily on direct payments from the European Union Common Agricultural Policy, which on average doubles their farm income. Most beef farms are classified as economically vulnerable, requiring farmers to engage in all farm work to supplement their income. And low prices and a sense that beef processors in particular and retailers are taking an unfair share of the profits has indeed fueled the anger um, and that resulted that contributed to uh, the conflict that we saw emerging in 2019. Multiple factors are putting pressure on the present system of conventional beef farming, uh, including shifting seasons and extreme weather events, competitive and declining markets, automation and technological innovation, and of course, COVID-19 has had its, uh, its effect also. And public opinion is also changing, uh, with some pointing to the harmful environmental and health effects of meat consumption um, and reducing uh, uh, consumer demand. All of this is problematizing the collective imaginary of the beef farming, of beef farming communities. And yet surprisingly, the concept of just transition has scarcely been applied to the concept by policymakers or indeed by researchers in the Irish context. And I'm drawing here upon work done by McCabe in 2019. Ireland's programme for government policy document, it references just transition 19 times in relation to the energy sector, but has very little to say about this concept in relation to the beef sector. So I want to move on now just to share with you the conceptual and analytical framework that we used for this um, for this paper. And I do apologize if the text is very, very small um, for you there. So let me just describe briefly what we've done. So as was mentioned by Orla, the concept of the just transition emerged as an important governance framework um, and it's most dominant in the debate on energy transitions. Emerging from the 1970s, um, very much focusing on workers and communities directly affected by environmental policies in the energy sector, which resulted in the loss of livelihoods and employment opportunities. And we know now that the concept forms a very a key part of global policy architecture on transitions, marked by the ILO's adaptation of the guidelines for just transition towards environmental, uh, environmentally sustainable economies for all, and indeed included in the Paris Agreement of 2015. And this research explores if and how this framework can help us make sense of the challenges facing the beef sector, and indeed how we might support that sector as it transitions. It gathers perspectives of farmers and key actor organizations on the changing state of their livelihoods and their key concerns for the future. But to do this, we developed a, a novel methodological approach and we drew upon framing as a strategic communicative device. It's widely used in the study of social movements, but not as commonly applied uh, to just transition research. And we blended this with a uh, just transition framework in order to explore the perspectives of key actors and farmers within the sectors. In the area of framing, issue framing is essentially, it's both a way of explaining sense making that underpins different perspectives, as well as a device for deliberative communicative strategies. So understanding how an issue is being framed by different actors allows for the identification of serious points of contention where these are likely to arise and indeed possible areas for compromises. So understanding the frames used by key actors is crucial um, as these can set actors on a particular path of action and it, indeed it can kind of blind them to alternatives, particularly in periods of disruption. Um, and we know the key actor frames um, they're essential in uh, shaping what information is deemed relevant to a particular issue and not only um, um, affect the aspects of an issue that people care about, but also dictate the actors involved and where the issues play out. Frames themselves can have a diagnostic, a prognostic or an action functions. And the diagnostic function relates to how the actor is interpreting the issue and its causes, as in sense making. The prognostic element is a prediction for how the issue will evolve based upon framing efforts. And the third element is the action uh, message or the solutions for which the actor is advocating. We blended this with the multidimensional environmental justice framework to help identify the different dimensions of justice or injustice that can be pre present within frames. And so we drew across an interconnected understanding of justice across three dimensions, distribution, representation and participation and recognition. To do this, we drew upon the theoretical work um, um, from the environmental justice uh, theories of Schlossberg and Collins, who identified these three interconnected dimensions. 
The reason we examined this case across these dimensions is because communities are affected by planned climate uh, adaptation and mitigation actions experience not only changes in their economic landscapes and opportunities, but also changes to culture, community identity and sense of place. Firstly, the dimension of recognition is identified as a precondition for distribution of justice that involves issues related to social respect for identities and values, cultural values of populations. Changes in economic activities affect not only income levels, but also social status, influence and structures within communities. And they can affect one's sense of belonging and purpose and are intimately linked to collective and self identities. Secondly, the dimension of participation is a key factor um, in developing relevant policies and practices that can build trust and ownership within communities in transition. Participation is closely linked to representation as representation from organizations and elected individuals in policy making processes allows citizens to participate in and be recognized by wider uh, society. And so just participation principles would demand that all persons and communities affected by a policy and action are consulted and are appropriately represented in decisions that affect them. And thirdly, the dimension of distribution is concerned with the principles that can guide the allocation of responsibilities, benefits and burdens of planned actions. This three dimensional approach provides a holistic governance framework and it helps to capture uh, the distributive elements and the socio cultural, uh, political, and power dimensions of a transition. Each dimension is interconnected and interdependent. And in this research, misrecognition, for example, is identified as a source of unequal distribution and exclusion from decision making fora. Misrecognition can take the forms of cultural domination, non-recognition and disrespect, and has a direct bearing on distribution and representation. Questions related to whose rights are recognised and how are rights and obligations allocated, respected and realised. So multidimensional accounts of justice that recognise the interconnections between distribution, participation and recognition have emerged in conceptualisations of just transitions as a wider, more holistic, integrated governance framework. And the just transition frames and functions model, it shows that the frames shape how the problem is diagnosed and what is the appropriate response to the problem. The problem of frame misalignment becomes very clear in this model and a corrective action from one frame does not solve the problem of a different frame. So, for example, if state policy compensates farmers for loss of livelihood by introducing reforestation schemes for agricultural land, for example, this does not address the loss of identity that a beef farmer and may experience and indeed it may accentuate that problem. Likewise, advocacy for cultural heritage will not address the issue of loss of livelihoods. So um, just to share with you the methodology and methods that we utilized. So we began by mapping the landscape of actors involved in this space and beef farming communities uh, to engage with the research. We conducted an analysis of key policy documents and publicly available documents from key actor organizations. And we use semi-structured interview methods to explore perceptions of both key actors and bee farmers on changes um, and current issues in bee farming. And then we apply the just transition frames and function model to analyze the data. Interview participants were sourced through open calls on so, um, farming group social media sites. Criteria for inclusion, as you would expect, is that all of those were above the age of 18. And in total, we interviewed eight beef farmers, both full and part time, and five representatives of key actor organizations. So this gives you an idea. This next slide just gives you an idea of the key actors involved and the documentation that we drew upon in order to explore uh, uh, this space. Um, and to share with you, what did we find? So in the document analysis, we found that all key actors recognize that the sector is facing exceptionally challenging times. All mentioned uncertainty, but they linked this to quite different causes. Climate action and just transition were not mentioned by any of the key actors, but mitigation of emissions uh, was noted as a growing challenge to the sector. The main concern identified by the majority of key actors uh, was the unfair uh, and uneven forms of distribution between processors, large farmers and smaller farmers. The beef plan movement, which emerged, uh, essentially that was the coordinating body which, or social movement which emerged as part of these protests, they emerged as a very distinct group in terms of prioritising concerns around participation and recognition, as well as distribution within their public narrative. And there was a, you know, there was a diversity of perspectives 
both within and between groups. But the interview data, particularly with the farm community, very much pointed to polarization and you know, very, very different issues uh, concerning that are concerning the farmers beyond the space of distribution. Within the key actor groups, so the kind of core organizations, we found that uh, within the distribution frame, we found that all key actors, including, um, except the BPM, they framed the future of beef farming as relating to and concerned with markets and issues of un uh, uneven distribution across the three frames, diagnostic, prognostic, and action. The problem was framed as being poor prices and the solution, higher cattle prices, protection of EU markets, and new trade deals. So all of the solutions were very much market-based and business as usual market-based. There was strong frame alignment uh, amongst most key actors that issues of distribution, prim primarily market growth, are the most important element for the beef sector. So all of the fixes were essentially current system at large uh, um, fixes. When we think about the actions, most of the actions are involved in market fixes, such as improved markets, market diversification, market growth, improved financial supports for farmers through new schemes and enhanced direct payments. When we look at the participation uh, frame of key actors, it was only really BPM that emphasized issues of representation in their diagnosis, claiming that established farming organizations, namely the IFA in this case, did not necessarily speak on behalf of beef farmers um, and that farmers have not been properly represented. They were really concerned with unequal distribution and representation or unequal representation uh, with evidence of the oversized influence and power of meat processors uh, holding control in the markets and prices resulting in what they argued were unfair value chains. One of Just their key aims for three more minutes. Great. One of their key gains is to gain respect and the issue of recognition and control within the sector. To come to the, the uh, farming community themselves. Um, all of the actors, all of the key actors recognize the challenge of uneven and uh, inequitable representation, but only the less powerful or the newly emerging key actors, i.e. the beef plan movement, identified participation and recognition. But when we come to the perspective of beef farmers themselves, the theme of distribution was raised by all, so it is a key concern, but it was not the main focus. All participants felt, um, all participants felt that they were not getting their fair share. Very few had heard the term just transition, but all participants felt that there's a lack of support for farmers who want to change to more sustainable practice, and that any additional costs for this change will be pushed through to farmers. Representation emerged as the key issue. A number of participants remarked there was a real feeling of us versus them um, between themselves and key actors in the space, which very much relates to recognition of their needs for greater need for representation within these structures. So I'm going to just move very, very quickly, if I can, through some of the key findings from the farmers themselves. I mean, essentially, they felt that they're not represented in the discussions. Uh, they felt that the real decisions are being made be behind closed doors. There was also a very, very strong focus on tradition versus change and a real concern around supports as they work their way through these changes. Beef farmers all spoke about ideas concerning recognition in order to diagnose the current challenges. And they also spoke of themes of powerlessness, underrepresentation, identity and tradition uh, versus change, all very much related to ideas of recognition. Some farmers expressed concerns over the, the perceived asymmetrical power relationships within the sector. Many stated feelings of powerlessness uh, in decisions made concerning their livelihoods and particularly regarding the burden of regulations uh, upon them. To quote, one says, we're under so much pressure from all the new rules and regulations, I just can't keep up. I think there was, there was two key themes which emerged within this particular space that are important. There was one major concern related to a loss of uh, small farming communities and the implications of that for rural, rural Ireland. Participants collectively noted that farmers will continue to farm despite the low, low income because of the diet the tie they feel to the land and how this connects them to their culture and their community. It is who they are. Um, and as a consequence, you know, the idea of essentially shifting away from this space to alternative livelihoods, even decent alternative livelihoods, is a cause of concern. It is a shift in identity. It is very much a shift in terms of, of how they are perceived within their communities and within their spaces. There is major concern around the decline of small scale and family farming, um, but it's recognised that this shift is happening. 
The second key theme to emerge was the desire and the interest in working together to identify more sustainable solutions and practices to make some changes. And half of the farmer respondents recognized the need for and expressed a strong interest in transitioning to environmentally friendly, friendly and climate smart agricultural practices. So I just very briefly want to kind of wrap up now in terms of the implications and areas for future research. In framing the main challenge facing the sector as, a dis as distributive matters and market focused solutions, key actor organizations leave hidden the situated and embedded power structures and relations that determine whose voices are heard and what factors should be considered. As social status and cultural loss are not monetized commodities, their loss is not necessarily acknowledged. But from a climate justice Schlossbergian perspective, if recognition is a precondition for distributive justice and participation is central to the legitimacy of deliberative processes, then distributive decisions that ignore or leave hidden key concerns and key voices are likely to be resisted and rejected. If the transition is to be just, it must move beyond single axis analysis of economic variables to multidimensional examinations of social, environmental uh, and cultural factors. Distribution, if we can think of it this way, it focuses on the what of injustice and inequity in terms of, treat, of treating the symptoms um, of the poor state of bee farming in terms of poor prices for producers. Recognition uh, um, and participation focus on the who, the how, and the why of injustice and inequity, uh, and question the underlying social, institutional, and cultural causes that lead to distributional uh, injustices. The poor viability of beef farming and the discontentment of beef farmers will not be remedied only with distributive fixes. Underlying issues of recognition and increased opportunity for participation should be addressed simultaneously and recognition is often neglected, in, uh, it's an often neglected element of justice and is largely absent in the frame of our key actors. And just to conclude, the research did not explore how might we look at encouraging key actors to consider um, thinking across wider frames beyond distributional matters towards issues of uh, representation um, and uh, recognition. We didn't necessarily consider that, but we would very much uh, focus on emerging literature in responsible inno uh, innovation and comprehensive governance frameworks to support sustainable transitions, which offer very promising pathways for future research. The problem of narrow, siloed, single access approaches to innovation and transition processes offers a starting point for this research and indeed for our research. And the need for wider, multidimensional frameworks such as just transition just transitions, frames and function models uh, that can consider not only economic dimensions, but wider ethical, social, cultural, political power dimensions are necessary to avoid community conflict, social and cultural harm, and to build the trust and ownership that is necessary and legitimacy that is necessary among affected populations as they transition towards sustainable practices. Thanks so much, Kian, and apologies if I ran over. Thanks so much. So let's pack, pass it along to Lucas, please. So hello everyone and thank you for inviting me to be among such distinguished guests and uh, lecturers and um, learned people. I will talk from the perspective of a practitioner. I'm not a researcher, so I'm just going to give a quick outlook on my practice uh, when it comes to environmental education uh, through the Green Schools program that I'm uh, part of. That I work off. And if you didn't know, uh, Antashka runs, Antashka is, is, a, is an Irish charity that takes care of um, natural Irish heritage and a historical heritage, but they also run an environmental education unit. And they run all these different programs that, um, that I suppose target um, educational aspects in different in different age groups and in different communities. And you probably know some of them like National Spring Clean or Blue Flags. Uh, but we recently started a lot of kind of civil science uh, programs as well, like uh, the GLOBE program, Clean Air. Um, but I'm working for the Green Schools program, uh, which uh, will celebrate 25 years uh, next year. It's a, it's a part of international program called Eco Schools and over 13 million people, uh, 13 million students across the globe participate in those programs. Uh, in Ireland, we have 10 different teams, five core teams and five maintenance teams. 
which focus on different aspects of environment from pollution waste, energy, water, uh, travel, which I'm working on, to biodiversity. Uh, we take a whole school approach, so we work with the pupils, with the teachers, and also reach out to parents. Our framework uh, for, for this uh, in a two years program, which was awarded by the Green Flag, works in seven practical steps from forming a Green Schools Committee to, to building an action plan based on environmental review. And two main areas of our work is awareness raising. So we teach about environment and good practice, but we also focus on behavioral change through uh, whole school actions. Uh, all our programs or our teams are kind of tailored to fit into the curriculum uh, in, with, on all levels because we now have the Green Schools program on primary school, secondary school, and also third level education. Okay. So when, when, I, when I was asked to, uh, to present here, I was just thinking, I, I will focus here more on, on ethics of climate change because um, this is something I've, I've actually touched on in my own practice. Uh, and I'm also a philosopher interested in, in working with students uh, in, a, in a philosophical inquiry type of learning. Um, so I was just thinking how to start this, and, and I just wondered, you know, what is environmental education? If we want to talk about, uh, you know, teaching for, uh, for sustainable future and teaching for just transition and for uh, good ethical um, behavior. I suppose we need to also ask a little bit when it comes to environment, what is environmental education? And an environmental education, really um, starts with connection with nature, with experience of nature. A lot of, a lot of this is, has to do with uh, the family values, but also maybe the values that are presented in the school. Um, and those practices, especially in the early, early years, uh, influence our behaviors as human beings uh, in the future. So according to studies uh, in the 80s, the, the three distinguished uh, kind of age groups and, and those three distinguished age groups for environmental education and environmental awareness um, are very important to consider. First of all, the early years uh, uh, are characterized by affection for animals and kind of emotional concern. And it's all to build relationship with, with, in the, with the natural world. When it comes to older children, like the primary school, the later primary school children, you know, we, we start teaching them about factual knowledge about the world and they kind of, that there is some, some kind of an expanding from their, um, from their own local, uh, looking in from their home and their old garden and their old uh, playground to more wider world to national and, and global perspective. Um, and there is also a place uh, for, uh, um, there's also a place for kind of beginnings of, of ethical uh, reflection um, about nature and, and the animal world. And then age on 12 onwards, there is some kind of increase in ethical ecological appreciation um, and also the, it's characterized by many psychologists and people who study child development that the kind of abstract concepts are becoming to becoming more important to consider. Uh, but basically the three aspects that you know comes from this research is that we, we, we need to look at connection with nature, ethical reflection, and factual knowledge. Um, so based on this, I was thinking about when, when we talk about climate change and uh, biodiversity crisis that we very often tackle with our program, we need to consider those stages of child development. We also need to be considerate and sensitive when it comes to teaching about it. The, the big problem with uh, eco-anxiety uh, and kind of overwhelming um, aspect of, of climate change crisis. Um, we need to be sensitive to how we talk about this um, uh, to, with teachers um, 
and, and children. And also us as educators, I can speak for this myself when I have to read all the research and then how do I present uh, this very gloomy sometimes scenarios or uh, difficult facts really about the world we live in, how to present this so we don't discourage students for being an active citizens. And then we need to tackle directly those challenges of anxiety uh, and kind of defeatism that, uh, and the embarrassment to kind of not getting stuck in inaction. And then we also need to address fake news and misinformation. That's also part uh, of the educational practice. Uh, teaching facts, uh, especially understanding the relationship between human actions and the crisis. Um, and also focus on positive solutions through actions, projects, innovation. Um, and obviously one of the big things is to give a sense of agency to children and because of those global problems, we need to consider a global perspective. But also, in, with all this, we should include reflecting on values, responsibility, and ethical aspects of the crisis, of the interconnectedness of nature and humans. And this could be done through inquiry-based learning and project-based learning as well. Um, so here is an example how we uh, build a kind of global perspective through our Green Schools program. So first of all, we, we do teach a basic science behind man-made climate change, and we align all our resources with the SDGs as well. So we give this perspective, um, kind of a global perspective to this. Uh, we very often contrast Ireland with other countries in the world. And as we know, Ireland is one of the biggest contributors to global warming per capita, and we're trying to make this perspective. Yeah, I think uh, something technical happened there. Um, I wonder if we should um, go directly with the questions, uh, Ian. Uh, great, so thanks to everyone in the audience who's already put some questions in. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, 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 Dr. Jean Moore, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, wanted to put a piece of information for information as chat disabled, excellent presentations. Uh, NESC's ongoing work on climate and agriculture with a just transition may be of interest, uh, and there's a link in the Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to just go in order. Um, the first question was from Paul O'Brien. Uh, Paul asks, how to affect north-south global financial transfers while avoiding diversion to local vested interests in target countries? Um, and I'm since he asked that during Orla's presentation, I'm, I'm going to um, suggest that Orla takes a crack at it, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, sure. It's a tough enough question. I suppose um, maybe how I'd initially understood the question, but I maybe have misunderstood is, is kind of the competing, you know, how do we mobilize finance and not, it, I think it's actually maybe does, how does it not go into the wrong hands? I think part of the mobilizing finance piece, because that is often uh, an understanding is, you know, these competing interests is actually to start to look at well, where could we very quickly mobilize finance from and one is actually to look at fossil fuel subsidies and to actually start to um you know if, if you want to frame it as a pollution pays but it's very much a just uh, transition and climate justice frame is to say possibly it's so dis disproportionately contributed to this problem and now have to pay the cost and part of that would just be to start actually looking properly at fossil fuel subsidies and and rowing back on those and keeping in mind so in Ireland alone uh, fossil fuel subsidi subsidies uh, ran to almost three billion and the majority of that this is CSO figures uh, is actually in revenue foregone so um, I think that's maybe an important place to start with it how it is targeted is uh, I, I mean, it, it, it is a very difficult um, act, no doubt. I think a lot of it is probably to do with, you know, how it's actually accounted for. In Ireland, we have a very strong tradition of kind of untied um, um, overseas uh, development aid. So continuing in that vein, emphasizing a kind of the, the importance of that. But some of it will also come. Um, and it's maybe on the more radical end too with a kind of debt alleviation and, and pushing for that um, framing. So I hope that's given some crack at the question and um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I think that that is a very large and very interesting question. 
Um, Ashley has um, one uh, which maybe um, either or both of the panelists might want to talk to. Do the speakers have thoughts on the composition of a just transition commission in Ireland and how best to make their recommendation impactful? So I just saw that Lucas is back. Um, let's take this question and then go back to the presentation if, if that works for you, Lucas. So um, Ashley has this question. Um, either Susan, Susan or Orla, you can unmute and uh, say something if you've got an idea. Yeah, I'm happy to, to, to take a crack at that, but I just wanted to come back, if I may, very briefly to the previous question as well. So I think there was a really interesting discussion this year in the Development Studies Association of Ireland's annual conference where we had the head of governance within UNDP talking about exactly this challenge around the, you know, the flow of climate financing and how do we ensure that it reaches the places that we need it to reach. And certainly the recommendation within that space and the key focus within that space is on governance structures, reviewing and ensuring that governance structures are sufficiently robust, sufficiently representative to be able to ensure oversight over the flow of funds and that they are reaching the appropriate point. So I think it is a big concern. Questions around absorptive capacity are, are a large concern and ways in which we might deal with this really, really do require us to think about those governance structures that we have in place that are very evident within the development cooperation space, but less evidence in the climate financing flows. And so it is about learning some of those lessons from the development cooperation space and bringing those into the climate financing space, I think a little bit more proactively. And very briefly on the question of the Just Transition Commission, I think one of the, I'm not necessarily going to talk about how, it, you know, how what the composition might be, but I would certainly, um, I would certainly hope that it would be a little bit broader in terms of its remit and its focus, away from simply a focus on transitioning livelihoods and training, uh, towards more wider considerations around community engagement in thinking about the types of solutions that may be appropriate for their spaces. I do think that the Climate Transition Commission has a wonderful opportunity to engage at grassroots levels with communities to understand what are their key concerns, what can be addressed through a just uh, transition commission or indeed through policies or um, appropriate approaches. And what maybe will, you know, we need to accept cannot be addressed, what may need to change, and working with communities about how do we recognise the symbolic value of this shift and this change. So I think it needs to, you know, I would love to see it broaden from its original composition uh, to give much wider focus and uh, attention and activity on community engagement in dialogue, not just telling communities what's going to happen, but actually working with communities to identify appropriate solutions for their spaces. So that's it for me. Thanks, Kian. Thanks. Um, good. So I think it's time to go back to, to Lucas. Um, thanks for the question, Ashley. And um, I will go back to you. Thank you. Mm, thank you very much. I, I apologize for the disruption, but uh, electricity on my street actually went down here and is back now. So I think I just finished on that slide. Um, this is how we, in some of our work, uh, build perspective, global perspective in our resources and our teaching. So we're, we're teaching science, we're teaching the facts about climate change. We align all the resources with SDGs. So here's an example of a global citizenship travel program. Um, for example, uh, is directly linked to reducing inequalities. That that is about you know poor cycling, walking infrastructure in our country, and maybe uneven amount of uh, number of girls, let's say, cycling to schools compared to boys. Only one in two hundred fifty girls uh, in Ireland cycles to school, for example. And there are issues there to be to be looked at, and we looked at, at that through the campaign anti cycles. Obviously, we link our work here to good health and well-being, to exercise, clean air. Uh, we, through our kind of link with local authorities, we also work toward more sustainable cities and communities by doing reports, walkability, cyclability, cyclability reports, and, and work with local authorities to actually implement the physical change. And all, obviously, we, we, it's all about climate change and climate action and all our work is encouraging climate action in schools. But we also contrast Ireland with other countries in the world uh, as, as being one of the most, one of the biggest contributors per capita versus our uh, developing countries. So we also kind of trying to put some emphasis on learning about Ireland specific issues, maybe how, you know, a great potential of wind energy we have here in the country. Also, um, I suppose what climate change uh, 
will do, uh, what will be consequence of climate change for our country. Here are some examples of actions that have a positive impact on different aspects of different programs. When it comes to travel by work, we had 86% of school recorded increase in sustainable travel. We have over 20,000 students participated in walk to school days uh, last year. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of uh, different other successes uh, going on, on the, with the different teams that we work on. Um, and we've noticed, and I've noticed since I'm working here for 2000, since 2014, that there was a big change in, in kind of a public perception of the problem of climate change. And, and it's, it's more widely accepted now that the, that the problem is there and we have to do, and it, it almost becomes fashionable to do this. And there's much less resistance uh, and much that our resources and our work much more welcome in the schools, I suppose. Um, it's very soft for, I suppose. Um, but is, is it enough with the time that we have left to take action on climate? Is it enough and how we can do this in education? So I want to come back to this type, kind of reflection, uh, reflection time in education because there's a lot of emphasis in the education on uh, what we can do, but very little on why are we doing this? Um, and this is when it comes to ethics. So when, when I go and ask children in, when teaching about climate change, I ask, you know, third, third class students, uh, if burning, burning fossil fuels is the problem, what is the solution? Uh, all the children would uh, say, obviously, it's to stop burning fossil fuels. But the question is, why knowing all this in the world, it, the change is so slow I and mean, we still um, kind of lack uh, um, appropriate action, I suppose. So in, in some of the resources uh, that I try to develop and some other resources we use with green schools, uh, we would like to focus directly on philosophical and ethical questions. Uh, and those help with supporting personal reflection, finding one's own perspective and forming an opinion. Um, but also when it comes to philosophical thinking, uh, we consider consequences of a given worldview. So if we do think that way, what kind of consequences it, it is, it gives us for the world that we live in. But we also, in philosophical discussions and inquiries, we hear the perspective of others and we are challenged by, um, by them as well. But those discussions and, and asking those ethical philosophical questions, we we're, we're forced to understand and internalize maybe the motivation. So instead of uh, what to do, uh, why to do it. And, you know, I'm not sure, if, I think that was Greta Thunberg that said that climate, uh, climate change, you know, the solutions, we already know what to do. It's, it's, it's a question is why are we not doing enough to, to do it? Um, here are some simple examples of the- Last resort. couple of minutes. Yes. Um, here are some examples of the resources. So we, we, we teach two stories. There's a lovely story, The Trouble with Dragons and with Junior um, Infants. We can, we can talk about uh, the dragons in this story and, and what kind of world they do and animals advising the, the kind of action on changing the world. We also, for example, look at journey to schools around the world, looking at the global perspective, how uh, you know, in a way, privileged we are in, in, in Ireland. Uh, even though we have problems with infrastructure, we still have so much better um, opportunities than in other world of you. And then I created this resource. Um, it was piloted with the St. Louis College in, in Kilchma. And the students were thinking for a couple of weeks on, on climate, ethics of climate change, and then presented their stories to them. Um, Minister for Climate Change, Dennis Norton. Um, and it's all based about, uh, about the questions related to ethics of climate change. And it's all built on P4C methodology, uh, which is kind of well-established you know, philosophical inquiry um, methodology uh, by Matthew Lichtman in the United States about 50 years ago. So it takes, it, it asks students questions and lead 
them to an inquiry to understand issues related to that. So questions like, do people have CO2 emission rights? Are we responsible for the things of our parents and grandparents? Um, one should one country go green if other refuse? Um, and I divided this in kind of four, five practical sessions. One is about motivation, we, where we, why should we act? We, disco we discover different uh, options, I suppose, and trying to understand them a bit more. Uh, obviously, tragedy of the commons, uh, the famous thinking experiment, comes very handy when it comes to climate change and uh, sharing uh, the atmosphere, but also uh, leads to questions, how can we ensure that everyone follows the rules that they have agreed on? Um, we, we talk to students about the strikes and the way um, that uh, civil disobedience is, is justified. Um, and then something about fairness and responsibility, looking at the kind of temporal spatial uh, responsibility when it comes to climate change. Uh, and then a little bit about carbon credits as well. But in short, um, I would just, I think in a summary, I would like to say that when it comes to ethics of climate change, one of the best things we can do in, in education is to building a relationship with nature. So going outdoors, being doing actions in nature, in the local environment, um, but also to introduce more time for reflection and discussion. And this is very much, I think, lacking in, in education. A lot of our education these days is based on the content and doesn't really go with the zeitgeist of times when we live in times of Google and stuff. So we need to emphasize kind of um, more skills like creative thinking, innovation, problem solving. Um, and that really is something that uh, philosophical thinking has um to offer as well in that regard and then collaboration with students around uh, from around the world from other countries could be a very good link to students as well to to actually hear a perspective of people who are i suppose living in countries more affected by climate change and and, and resonating directly on kind of a human level on a heart level Can we wrap it up yeah and that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Um, great. So um, uh, I think that those are some really excellent and important reflections. Uh, if the other panelists would turn their cameras on, I think uh, we have time for one last thing. Um, just on on on, on uh, what Lucas was just talking about, I I think that it's really important to connect to children and um, uh, with, with about climate change. And I very much endorse the idea of. of um, exposing them to the uh, uh, natural world as a way of making sure that that's a, a personal psychological link. I've, I've, I've made a, I've written a little bit about this. Um, okay, so uh, I wanted to take uh, Michelle Murphy's question because it was really well put and, and very clear to the different presenters. So uh, Michelle Murphy wrote um, uh, a question for Susan. Could you elaborate a little on the issue of representation and how farmers feel their concerns are not being heard? And a question for Orla, how can we ensure there is a focus on those who will be most impacted, but who have contributed the least? Um, uh, and um, yeah, so uh, Susan, so maybe half a minute each, <laughs> Susan? Yeah, um, so I would say very briefly, I think our research, which focused on a very small, it's a qualitative piece of work. So I think I don't want to overgeneralize from the findings that we had, but I think when we interrogated and when we examined what was being said by our uh, in our semi-structured interviews by our farmers, we found that people were very much concerned with issues of unfair and unequal distribution, yes, but they were equally and possibly more concerned with two key factors. The first one, the decline and the disappearance of small farm uh, family farmers, and secondly, the need to move towards more sustainable practices, uh, but a lack of conversation and consultation around that. And a key element of the discussion that they that they that emerged from that discussion was that they need to shift power and that farmers need to, to help to be part of the conversation so that they can regain some of the respect that they felt uh, that they had lost. So issues of representation, who is represented in field, are they being represented? Are these key concerns being considered 
by the main representative bodies, both government and the IFA, at that point in time, farmers clearly felt they were not being considered in that space. So representation, lack of representation was a key concern, which resulted in you know, unplanned protests on the street, outside government buildings, um, um, and very much got the attention that was needed um, for their cause. Back to Keen. Thanks so much. And Orla. Um, so I think I'll try to be as quick as I can, but I think the big idea with this is we can talk about it at a global sense and at uh, kind of a domestic sense. So in the global sense, our way of ensuring that we are kind of foregrounding and focusing on those who've least contributed is in two ways. It's about really, really scaling up um, climate finance, but it's also about taking responsibility as a wealthy developed country to rapidly reduce our emissions in the short term um, to save whatever atmospheric space is left for uh, countries in the global south so there's that recognition also the technology transfer piece i think at the domestic level then there's a recognition that within ireland even there's a big discrepancy between emissions of say wealthier people versus uh, people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds additionally you have the kind of competing thing where people you know are focusing on end of the month issues so it's very hard to focus on end of the world issues and so really what that to me means is you know this integration as i was trying to bring out in my presentation presentation of climate justice and just transition across um, our policy making. So having to act consistently with just transition would mean that all of our policies have to really, really foreground that. And that might be things like actually looking at, you know, how accessible are our retrofit schemes when most people in my generation can't access them as, um, you know, uh, young people who are predominantly renting say or accessing ev grants that are uh, for the most part just making it cheaper for a wealthy person in dublin to buy a car uh, ev versus somebody who maybe needs it so i think it's it's kind of recognizing um some of that is really important and i think the integration of um just transition across policy making in climate, but also broader, um, it, it is kind of an important part of that piece so i hope i've given that a good stab in my 30 seconds Thanks so much. And uh, thanks for the question, Michelle. And thanks to everyone for your questions. Thanks to everyone for attending. Um, there's a quick break and then we'll be back uh, in a few minutes. Uh, should be on the hour, ideally. Um, and uh, uh, we hope to see you for session two. Um, thanks so much, everyone. Good morning and welcome back to session two. Um, the second session uh, today is going to talk, it's going to share uh, two different papers looking at insights from moral philosophy and economics for the design of carbon taxes. Um, and so I'm delighted that we have um, two speakers. We have Kim Mitzwu from UCC and we have our organizer um, and, and really the brains behind this session this morning, Miguel Angel uh, Tovar. Um, just to briefly introduce our two speakers this morning, um, Dr. Mitzvu is a lecturer in UCC uh, and co-affiliated with Philosophy and the Environmental Research Institute. Uh, he's discussed climate policy with Canadian and Irish politicians, including at COP26. And last year he was awarded the Andrew Light Award for Public Environmental Philosophy. So very welcome, Keen. Um, secondly, we have Dr. Miguel uh, Tovar, uh, Angel Tovar, and Miguel is a research officer with the ESRI at the Energy and Environmental Research Unit, and his research interests include the distributional effects of energy and environmental policies and microsimulation. Uh, he's published in national and international peer-reviewed scientific journals, and he chairs a research network on fuel poverty with the participation of different government bodies in Ireland. I'm delighted to welcome both of our speakers uh, this morning, and Kian, I will pass over to you to kick us off with your paper on the ethical insights for the design of carbon taxes. Thanks. Thanks so much uh, for the kind introduction, and thanks again, everyone, for being here this morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about the importance of carbon pricing in the context of Ireland today. So um, part of the brief here is a question of what uh, philosophy has to do um, with climate policy, what is our role in this discussion. And my view is that there's all kinds of things that philosophers can do, several of them have been alluded to, but in the current context, one thing we can do is we can identify what morally relevant factors are at issue in policy discussions today. Um, and I'm going to do it, try to do that because we actually find ourselves at a very uh, surprising point in climate policy discussions. In most countries, as, as many of us are aware, um, there are not large concrete proposals on the table or they're uh, not agreed to. Um, but of course in Ireland, 
there is uh, uh, there is a national climate plan, uh, and the importance of having such national policy has been alluded to, for example, by by Orla. Um, but there's a lot of discussion about how this is going to happen. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull out a few uh, relevant strands about why carbon pricing um, is an important part of this. Um, and before I do so, I do want to um, acknowledge and, and agree with what Orla mentioned, which is that we shouldn't think of carbon pricing as um, a quick fix or a cure-all. Um, but I do think that it is uh, very justifiably considered part of uh, the, um, the policy or, of proposals, the portfolio of proposals, and here's why. So where do we stand today? Well, as we know, um, we have uh, an, an ambitious carbon budget and we have the climate action plan. And the question is, how are we going to, um, how is this going to be uh, actualized? What is actually going to happen? And I think that, again, one thing that's surprising um, and a little bit unusual is that there's quite a lot of cross-party agreement in this country um, and that means that the question is, how is it going to be um, put into effect and how is it going to be accepted by the public? So the state of play as I see it is that the carbon budget uh, that's been put forward is uh, timely, of course, and, and it's quite ambitious, uh, even on a global uh, scale. As we know, Ireland has been a climate laggard for some time, but uh, with this budget, uh, if we can make these targets, um, in actuality, then that's a, a real positive step. And it would suggest it would put Ireland um, amongst the forefront of nations acting today. So the question that I'm gonna concern myself with is uh, what moral reasons there are to retain carbon pricing in this context. And I'm going to discuss a few that I think are especially important. So those are the first that is that when we think about the climate action plan, there are a lot of um, components of this plan that require funding. Um, and so it seems to be fairest if those who are contributing most of the problem are contributing to the costs of addressing that problem. The second point I want to make is that uh, we know um, the, well, the Russian invasion into Ukraine has demonstrated just how important geopolitical um, uh, costs there are to being resilient, reliant on countries with uh, problematic um, governance structures, and uh, something that, of course, we, along with um, all of our other European allies, understand is that um, paying uh, for uh, fuel at the same time as trying to um, undermine the power of these kinds of uh, governments is uh, 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 counterproductive, to put it uh, bluntly. Um, the other thing that I want to draw attention to, which is maybe a little bit specific to the Irish context, is that in the COVID uh, crisis context, we saw that um, Irish people are willing to act pro-socially, that is um, act for the good of others. We've been able to, uh, of course, social distance, we've been able to get immunized and uh, so forth at rates that are um, at or above our European peers. And that suggests that we are able to look beyond the short term, look beyond our own personal interest, which um, uh, as, as at ESRI, we all know uh, many economists assume is the primary motivation, uh, but it might be surprising from that point of view just how much we're able to act pro-socially. And finally, and this is most relevant to the just transition context, if we need, to, if we want to build back better, if we want to build a green infrastructure, if we want to build a green um, activity, then we need market signals to indicate which kinds of market activity we want. So let's go through these. So the first question is, what is the capacity for carbon pricing to contribute? Um, and at this moment, uh, we know that uh, carbon pricing is contributing more to global budgets than it has um, at any time in the past and, and by quite a lot. So here you can see from the Financial Times just last month, uh, and maybe just a couple of weeks ago even, um, how uh, carbon pricing um, revenues have increased. Now, that's far short. It, these are very small numbers in absolute terms, but the growth of them is quite significant. So there's capacity for carbon pricing to contribute significantly uh, to budgets. And in the context of Ireland, that's especially important because the Climate Action Plan uh, has a lot of uh, components that are not free to implement. And if we explain or the public understands that those are needed uh, to build a greener Ireland, but that has costs, it makes sense that those costs uh, for things like retrofitting, for things like expanding uh, green infrastructure, green transit options, 
um, and of course, for things like uh, networks of charges, all of these things have large upfront costs, but they, we benefit from them both um, environmentally, um, but also in terms of long-term economic sustainability, but they have upfront costs and those upfront costs, it uh, seems reasonable to think is fairest to be paid by those who pollute the most. Um, for those who are familiar with the jargon, polluter pays principle is often used in this context. Those who pay for, um, who, those who emit should pay for the damages and the costs um, of mitigation. So if that's the case, then we might think that the climate action plan in the Irish context should be paid for by those um, in Ireland who are contributing most, that is those who are emitting the most carbon. Um, as our economist friends might say here at uh, ESRI, if the costs of an ac action threatened or are borne by society, then they should be internalized. The um, polluters should face the cost of those emissions in order to align their incentives so that they are acting in the most pro-social behavior or the socially optimal um, way. So um, I've discussed this in, in a paper um, called Carbon Pricing Ethics, uh, indicating some of the basic arguments about why carbon pricing actually contributes to distributive justice. And in particular, um, can uh, the revenue can be recycled in ways that are uh, morally uh, justifiable and help uh, decrease the costs on those who are worst off. Okay, so that's the first set of um, considerations, right? So in Ireland today, we have the Climate Action Plan. I suggested it's an ambitious plan, um, but it has a lot of upfront costs. And so, uh, for the Irish public, they should understand that when we're thinking about how those costs should be borne, it makes sense that those who are polluting the most should pay for them. And that's a justification for carbon pricing. Now we can move on to something which is uh, very new and of course, uh, too recent for, for me and my other academic colleagues to have published on it because uh, um, as you may or may not know, the uh, publishing process is quite slow in academia. Um, and that's the moral importance of uh, uh, Russia's invasion. Um, so here, this is just from yesterday, uh, new images as, as it might've faded into the background for some of us, but of course it's very much ongoing and very much uh, causing um, uh, severe devastation um, to the Ukrainian people. And so what that tells us is that in this context where politically the European Union is trying to undermine uh, Russia's uh, expansionist policies, um, violently expansionist policies, uh, it's counterproductive for us to be uh, paying for this. And paying for this is, is not too strong a term. When, when the war started, uh, it was estimated that 700 um, uh, million American dollars a day uh, were being contributed uh, to the Russian government by, uh, in, uh, by paying for oil with an additional roughly 400 million US dollars uh, pay for gas globally. Uh, those are staggering sums. Um, and if we can reduce our reliance on these kinds of um, uh, morally uh, compromised actors, um, I, I would suggest, then that seems like a strong moral consideration in favor of uh, increasing our, the greenness of our economy and reducing our reliance on fossil fuels. Um, here's, here's, a, here's a little um, snippet from the Times. Um, uh, the Times, uh, an opinion in the Times uh, called it um, a, a fossil fuel war. Um, they said that it was not going too far to say that uh, the war in Ukraine is driven by the uh, revenues of fossil fuels. And again, um, we might want to reduce our reliance on those um, fuels. So once again, here, the idea is that if we have a carbon price that reduces our incentive to, um, uh, uh, to burn oil and other fossil fuels and to reduce our, um, the uh, revenues that go towards these kinds of governments that we might think of as uh, morally objectionable. Uh, but again, this, goes, uh, this is recent enough that it's not reflected yet in the academic literature in a strong way. Another thing that's especially relevant to the Irish context uh, is um, that uh, the Irish people are, 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 have shown themselves to be surprisingly pro-social. Um, uh, Fenton O'Toole um, had a, a, an opinion that I particularly liked in the Irish Times called shocking news, uh, Irish people may be sanest in Europe. The low level of anti-vaccine sentiment is a very good sign for our democracy. And so what does that show? That shows that people were willing to do something that was somewhat uncomfortable, somewhat annoying. Um, and most of the uh, benefit 
of um, uh, getting a vaccine, for example, is not for you. It's primarily to increase the general social protectedness against, uh, against COVID-19. Um, so what that suggests is that Irish people are willing to do things for their friends and their neighbors. Um, and in some sense, we might think of reducing our emissions, um, paying the costs of carbon pricing uh, to reduce those uh, as being uh, a long-term thing that helps pr protect our neighbors um, from particulate matter and other sort of local environmental pollutants, but also on a sort of a larger scale, protecting um, the globally vulnerable, uh, as was mentioned by, by Orla as well as others. Uh, one of the important things about climate change is that the impacts of climate change are disproportionately borne by uh, the poorest in the world um, and uh, who, who did the least to contribute towards it. So in some ways, um, uh, paying these costs is part of protecting those around the world. Um, and so I think that this is another way in which we might think surprisingly, perhaps, well, surprising to O'Toole at least, um, the Irish might be especially appropriate for this kind of uh, pro-social far-reaching um, action. Um, so I, I discussed this uh, uh, on the Ryan Tuberty show uh, and there my, my message was, when we're thinking about the role of um, the Irish in acting uh, pro-socially, the COVID-19 uh, crisis has shown us that we are um, uh, surprisingly uh, surprisingly open to acting, not uh, selfishly, but again, for uh, those amongst us who might be most vulnerable. Of course, in the COVID-19 context, that might be the immuno immunocompromised, that might be the elderly, it might be the very young, uh, but it's certainly uh, for those of us who are young and healthy, it's less for us and it's more for others. And I think that that is uh, a really heartening message and one that uh, I wish we uh, took to heart. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what does that say? Well, that says when we're talking about carbon pricing, of course, it's initially painful or costly, but we might think that morally speaking, the Irish are willing to um, do things that are uh, for the sake of others. And I think that that's a really wonderful thing. And, and um, as a new, um, uh, as a new Irish resident, uh, I've, I've been here for uh, just under two years. Um, I, I find it um, very, uh, very wonderful. Okay, so the last thing is coming out of the COVID-19 crisis, uh, we might think that this is actually the best time to be rebuilding in a greener way. Now, why is that? So um, early on in the pandemic, I, I wrote a, um, an opinion with a with an important moral philosopher, uh, his name is Peter Singer, uh, and we wrote this opinion um, saying that when we're thinking about the COVID-19 context, there's massive uh, what we would call supply shocks, massive shocks to our uh, uh, the chains of production um, and and supply, uh, and those have been uh, those were and initially they had to, they were onshored, um, that is they the sort of international connections were a lot of them were broken. Uh, subsequently, as we know, there were uh, slowdowns internationally, and there's been a lot of uh, rebuilding of these kinds of um, production facilities and supply chains. And that rebuilding is a chance to build back in a greener way, build back in a way that is reflective of um, not brown ways of doing things, but green ways of doing things. And so in an op-ed, which I um, followed up uh, with, with a policy analysis article, uh, I argued with colleagues that when we're thinking about the um, co costs and impacts of climate change, we should have that market signal as we recover and as we try to recreate institutions, uh, production, uh, supplies, and, 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 and other kinds of um, parts of the economy in ways that are greener. And if we don't have that price signal, then that's um, uh, costly to us. Okay, so. To wrap up, the basic idea here is that when we're thinking about the climate action plan, what we're looking for is the role uh, that climate uh, carbon pricing would contribute. And my suggestion is that, especially in the Irish context, there is a strong way in which um, carbon pricing is uh, both a, sort of a structurally necessary part of the plan, it helps us to um, uh, contribute to the costs of the, this plan, but also it sort of reflects the Irish um, 
uh, spirit in a way that might be a little bit surprising. Certainly, was surprising to me as a um, as a new uh, as a new immigrant. Uh, and so, when we're thinking about coming to this, uh, what the public should know about carbon pricing, it's that it's the role, it's the way that we pay for all of the good things that are going to make us sustainable and green in the long term. It's the way that we're going to send the signal that we want to do things that are not brown, but are green, whether those are products and services, whatever part of the economy we're talking about. And it's part of the way that we avoid um, sending money to morally compromised regimes. So in short, uh, I think that carbon pricing reflects conditions on the ground. Uh, it helps to cover the actions in a way that's fair to those who are, um, uh, those who are uh, the, to the government who has to pay for all of these upfront costs, uh, which will allow us to, again, do things like charge electric vehicles, whether those are things like ride bikes in more areas, whether those are things like uh, retrofitting, um, which is, again, very costly upfront, but in the long term pays for itself and then some. All of these things are really important for us to be able to um, contribute to. And so that's one reason why we might want carbon pricing today. Another is that uh, the uh, war or invasion in Ukraine tells us that it's especially important today to consider the impact on those, uh, the geopolitical uh, implications of our strategic um, use of these resources. Uh, it tells us that uh, it might reflect something that uh, is, is especially Irish or is especially shown to be Irish in the past couple of years. And of course, uh, finally, um, as we continue to recover, we might want to um, have the right signals so that we develop uh, green ways of um, supplying the economy, green ways of running our businesses and our services and not brown ways. Uh, thanks very much for your time and attention. Really interesting uh, presentation and perfect timing. So I did not need to, uh, to interfere with your flow at all. So thanks so much for that. Um, now I'm delighted to hand over to Miguel, uh, who is going to talk to us about the cost of inaction. Um, before Miguel starts, can I just invite our uh, participants uh, to please share any questions that you may have in the Q&A function, which is just at the bottom of your screen. Thanks, Miguel, and over to you. Thank you, Susan. Um... Thank you everybody for uh, participating. Uh, special thanks for the presenters and the panelists and everybody that is attending to this uh, webinar. Thank you very much. So uh, just in line with uh, what uh, our colleagues have said, um, carbon pricing is not the only mechanism that can be implemented. And it has been recognized by leading features in economics. Uh, Professor Stiglitz, uh, Nobel Prize of Economics, he, in a, in a current uh, article, he he acknowledged that carbon tax is a flexible tool that can be used, can be adjusted by, by the policy maker, can also be um, complemented by other policies like technological change, support for technological change, uh, support for uh, subsidies for uh, investing in, in new technologies and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, just to say in that line that carbon taxation is seen also recognized by, by uh, leading economists. That is not the only tool that will solve the problem. It's, it's a tool that is there. It has to be complemented, and it has to be adjusted according to the situations, um, and uh, particularly to the need of achieving uh, environmental targets. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the things that uh, I have to start with. The, the second thing I want to say is that uh, in this article, we try to go beyond what uh, normally is said in terms of um, uh, well, I, ha I have this a quotation from, um, uh, I was looking for a quotation to start with a philosophical quotation, and instead of that, I found this quotation from Arnold Schwarzenegger, and kind of shocked me the fact that even public features are standing up and talking about this issue, that climate change is real, and it, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's harming people. So that was kind of the thing that struck me, that even uh, in, in, in more informal environments, this has been recognized. In fact, Arnold Schwarzenegger was invited to one of the, the environmental meetings, international environmental meetings uh, some years ago. But uh, the thing that I wanted to highlight is that um, during this um, crisis, climate crisis, uh, we talk about all of costs, but there are some benefits as well in implementing carbon taxation. And this is part of the message that I want to pass in this uh, 
in this article that is there is a cost associated with with the transition but also there is some benefits on that and in terms of that this is uh, something that is uh, coming on more recently in the literature trying to measure the impact of not doing uh, the transition and mostly this is going towards very um catastrophical issues that uh, have started to materialize in some part of the world like losses in, in, in productivity regarding food production, uh, energy supply, uh, disruptions that are creating some cost, and even uh, in some countries, even uh, some, some fatalities there. So all of this has a cost that economists, economists are trying to measure and put that on the table and say, this is what it would cost not doing anything. And uh, this is partly the, the, the central motivation of this, but uh, as a mainstream economist, I would like to measure and see how these costs are distributed across the different population in Ireland, but also uh, try to, to identify different dimensions of, of uh, uh, justice or in, this, in, in, in the transition. So uh, hopefully I'll give you some of this, the flavor of these uh, dimensions, trying to measure these, these dimensions and, and give you some of this uh, idea where as an economist, we can identify some of these uh, fairness in the, in the transition. So we we'll start with this. Uh, there is a plenty of uh, literature that's talking about uh, how to measure the incidence, how to measure the distributional impacts. But again, very little information on the benefits of doing this. So in that line, this is, kind of, this is the contribution of this paper, trying to make door and say, yes, we talk about costs, but also there are benefits that should be considered. Um, just uh, in terms of the methodology, we use the household budget survey for Ireland. We have uh, the consumption for different commodities in this survey. We have a bit of the uh, income sources, and uh, uh, that's the main uh, information that we use to do this uh, estimation. Just for those that are not uh, familiar with uh, these methodologies, so basically I have to um, prepare different bundles of consumption. So among them, energy that is consumed by the household. This is only talking about households. Um, so we have changes in prices, commodity prices, but also you can do changes in income. In this presentation, I'm just focusing on changes in, in, in commodity prices, which is uh, carbon taxation or more uh, known in the literature as uh, indirect taxation. This is uh, where the center of all of this uh, for this presentation is going to be. Just to start with the identification of some of these um, inequalities, you can see, for example, this graph that, that gives you the, the proportion uh, of the budget that houses are putting towards paying for transportation and paying for uh, heating and lighting. As you can see, the poorest one put that larger share of the budget to pay for this commodity. So already you can see this is repeatedly shown in the literature that low income households, uh, when they face carbon taxation, they will be, hit, they will be hurt uh, uh, disproportionately because already they are putting a lot of money or more, a, big, a larger budget for these commodities. So uh, coming from the literature, uh, they have quantified that uh, if we don't reach the environmental targets uh, in terms of the global temperature, uh, we will face uh, for each degree that we cross this threshold, a uh, loss in income of 1%. So this is, um, the literature also recognizes that this is a very limited estimation given that uh, losses in biodiversity and other kind of uh, losses are not considered. So the damage could be much larger than this, but we take this as a, as a, uh, as a measure in the lower bound of the, of the possible losses. But the losses could be much higher than that, and that's recognized by the literature. The other thing that is uh, not really clear is uh, how this cost or these benefits of avoiding this uh, environmental crisis will be distributed across different households. And uh, the literature shows that uh, this, this cost will be uh, accrued to low income households. They will be the most exposed to activities that are required or that are in, in, in extreme contact with, the, with nature, like agriculture, tourism, and stuff like that. So those are the ones that will be uh, hit the most uh, from, from uh, the environmental, uh, the, the, the result of the environmental crisis. And, uh, but it's not clear, the literature hasn't come and estimate these things. So we have to make some assumptions. And one of the assumptions that we made is what happened if this is uh, the, the losses attributed to the, to the climate crisis 
are accrued to low-income households and what happens if it's accrued to everybody in the same amount. So we have the two uh, assumptions here to show you what are our findings in that uh, regard. So uh, in terms of the simulation, we simulate an increase of uh, carbon taxation for uh, 80 euros per ton for, for CO2 emissions. And we also simulate uh, an allocation as a lump sum, lump sum transfer of 40% of the carbon revenues. And this is something that has been highlighted by, by uh, Kian in, in the previous presentation that one of the advantages of carbon tax taxation is that you can generate a revenue as well that can be used to, um, uh, once the, 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 the fairness aspects has been identified, you can use this revenue as well to tackle these this issues. So that's one of the advantages of carbon taxation. Okay, just uh, starting with the results of, of the model. Uh, the first thing that I found are these elasticities for heating uh, and uh, transportation. This is estimated by uh, the, the more vulnerable households in the first row and then the, the wealthier uh, households. And they seem to be quite similar, but in reality, it, it does make a difference because the, the background of this is telling you that more vulnerable households have more problems to, to, to reduce their energy, energy consumption. And this is uh, in line with other research that we published recently where we found that low-income households tend to have lower energy efficiency in their dwellings. So in the face of carbon taxation, this is another uh, dimension of, of, of the fairness in, in, in the transition that not everybody has the same elements to reduce their energy consumption. And this is one of the things that we have to tackle when we talk about uh, carbon taxation. Um, these inequalities in, in the ability to reduce uh, our footprint. The second thing that I want to show you is this graph. And apologies for the technical uh, words that are there, but just, just uh, I'm going to try to describe in a, in a, in a simple way these, these graphs. So basically, this is the, the cost, the, the burden as a proportion to the household. Uh, available money, disposable money to spend on different commodities. And as you can see, the, the, the gray bars are telling you that uh, originally taxes is regressive, so people are losing money. They have to pay for this uh, carbon tax. But then when we uh, assume that the benefits are included, so this is the black uh, bar, and this is uh, equally um, the damages or the benefits to do, to do some action are distributed equally to the, to the population, you can see that uh, the most vulnerable households that are in the lowest income uh, deciles, they don't lose anymore. So this is comparing the cost of the carbon tax, the burden of the carbon tax, with the benefits of the, uh, the avoiding the crisis, the 1% that, that I described in, in income losses. And this is distributed equally. Uh, the result shows that carbon taxation is not as regressive in net, in net results as, 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 as is. In fact, it's not uh, regressive at all for, for low income households. And but if the, if the benefits are distributed, uh, uh, having an extra emphasis or accrued to low-income households, they even uh, have better uh, better outcomes in terms of the, the cost, of, the net cost of the carbon taxes. So the measures for this graph is basically saying that when you compare the cost and the benefits of avoiding the climate crisis, carbon taxation is not as expensive as we as we have been believing, and even even more, it's not. Um, disproportionately affecting low-income households, as we have uh, been believing. So when we talk about uh, the, the, the changes in the consumption patterns, uh, carbon taxation shows that you can reduce emissions. And, and it's, 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 this is true for all income uh, uh, sales. So carbon taxation can, can really uh, get us to achieve certain targets and reduce energy consumption. The other, the other dimension that I want to highlight in terms of the fairness in the transition is the fact that uh, here in this, in this graph, I'm showing you the heterogeneity in the experience after doing some uh, 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 revenue uh, uh, recycling uh, approaches. So uh, the black bar showed you what would happen in the heterogeneity if we do, we do a flat allocation, so a lump sum. The, the, the heterogeneity is mainly experienced by houses in the second side. This is basically saying that there is a, 
a huge uh, diversity in terms of the, the how they are um, uh, benefiting from the transfers. So you create a lot of inequality within the brackets, something that is also not very well um, mentioned in the literature, but more and more, they, they, they call it, um, now they, they talk about horizontal and, and, and vertical inequalities in, in revenue recycling. And what this graph is showing you is that by different revenue recycling mechanisms, you generate certain inequality, not in the whole population, but within the brackets. That's something that also, uh, as a, uh, when, when we design policies, have to consider that uh, we can create other, other sources of inequality by reallocating uh, the revenue as well. So that's another dimension of this uh, fairness aspect that has to be uh, considered. So, I come with the with the with the conclusions of this um, article. So, uh, what, some of the things that I want to highlight first is again to emphasize that carbon taxation is a is a useful tool in terms of reducing the, 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 the emissions that we create through energy consumption. But also, we highlight in this research that there are inequalities in terms of doing this transition. Some people have more capabilities to reduce than others, and this has to be tackled. Uh, in the policy design. The other part of this is, uh, what are the inequalities we create when we reallocate the revenues as well? And that's something that has to be uh, analyzed and, and take it uh, into consideration. And uh, the, the other thing as well in this uh, part is that um, uh, with, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the normal economic tools of the mainstream economic tools, we are able to identify some inequalities that are happening in, in, the, in the policy design that uh, have an importance, not only in terms of um, creating uh, political acceptance uh, for carbon taxation, but also to engage with the population and that they also uh, start to look after their own uh, emissions rather than um, uh, put everything into a uh, policy instrument. And it becomes more like a, a instrument for uh, social uh, coordination and collaboration. That's, uh, and this has to happen through showing the just transition uh, points of, of, the, of this policy design. So that's, uh, that's what I have uh, for this presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Miguel. Absolutely fascinating um, insights from your presentation. Um, so I'm going to move now, uh, with everybody's permission, on to some of the questions um, that have been raised. And I would remind our participants that if you would like to raise a question for Miguel or for Kian, please use our um, Q&A function. Um, so I'm going to start with the first question that has arrived in for us, and it's from Ashley. And I think it's a really interesting question because one of the things that struck me in listening to Keane's presentation was a focus on the polluter pay principle and the, you know, the, the argument that it is the fairest way. Um, and again, it, it, it kind of contrasted somewhat with Miguel's presentation, which very much looked at questions related to the ability to pay principles also, and about the balance between polluter pay and ability to pay. But Ashling, our participant, I think has, has framed this really well. Um, and she asks the question, is it fair to impose carbon, uh, carbon pricing on members of the community who absolutely do not have the means to choose fuels other than fossil fuels. So with, when there are no alternatives, is it fair to impose this? For example, she says, many working people in this country are reliant on expensive oil heating, old diesel or petrol cars, because there's minimal public transport coverage outside of the main urban areas. I ask this even if people can expect to get a rebate in the form of a fuel allowance grant, um, as in white change in the first place and create an unpopular association with climate action. So it's a difficult question, Kian, and we will come to you for uh, your response. And Miguel, I'll come to you and ask if you have anything additional to add also. Thanks so much, Susan, and thanks so much, um, Ashling, for that excellent and really important question. So I think there's a, a couple of ways to um, answer that. One, one thing that I think is especially important is that word, um, that last question, why charge in the first place and it create that association? Um, and you might think, well, if, they're, if you're getting the money back, then uh, wouldn't it be better just not to have it at all? And there's a couple of important uh, things here. So one thing to say is I actually don't support the um, fuel allowance as the use of those resources, because I agree that undermines the incentive to reduce your fuel. 
Um, I think that it would be better to put that money into things that everyone um, uh, can enjoy, such as uh, uh, public health, uh, or maybe things like improving the um, uh, the uh, um, a bus and and, and um, uh, alternative transportation networks, so that there are options. Because I agree that in much, many parts of that country, that is not the case, and that's um, unfortunate, and that makes it much harder. However, I think that there's a couple of um, so I, I wouldn't I wouldn't support the fuel allowance use of that. I would put it towards things like retrofitting. I would put it towards things, as I said in my presentation, like transport networks, things like um, the uh, charging stations, which allow for alternatives. Now, it's true that in the short term, those don't necessarily always help. I, I'm happy to grant that. That's correct. These these things take time. And unfortunately, um, that is hard. But as Miguel pointed out, and I want to emphasize, um, if we take a simple, that is flat rebate, that is just dividing up the resources amongst the citizens, that's not how most policies work, but that's a very simple approximation, then in most cases, that'll end up being slightly progressive. The overall incidence of, of taxing and rebating ends up being progressive. And that's been looked at in many different um, jurisdictions, and very roughly speaking, uh, uh, the poorest 60%, 60 to 70%, depending on your jurisdiction, end up ahead and the um, wealthiest sort of 30% or the most spending 30% um, end, up, uh, end up paying. So um, that, that was shown in one of uh, Miguel's uh, graphs, but it's also uh, diagrams, but it's also been shown in many other jurisdictions that the net effect of carbon pricing and rebating, at least a flat rebate is slight progressive, slightly progressive. Now you don't get paid directly necessarily in terms of a fuel uh, allowance, but it might be in other services that compensate you or more than compensate you in, in response. Now I'm just gonna take one second to give you a concrete example of this because I think that it's important to um, have a figure that's a little bit more easy to grasp than um, some of Miguel's points. So this is a super simple example, which I like to put on a blackboard. Suppose you spend 10,000 euros a month huge amount of money, really wealthy. I'm a lot poorer. I only spend a thousand euros. Okay. So be, let's suppose that it's regressive in the sense that the fuel, uh, any, any sort of carbon tax would hit me harder because more of my money is in say heating costs and more of yours is on things like, I don't know, buying fancy art or something, things that are not that carbon prices won't affect very much. Okay. So let's suppose that that effectively doubles my taxation as opposed to yours. So I get taxed at 10%. You only get taxed at 5%. So if you do the sums, uh, that this would end up you, um, you spending uh, 500 euros a month, I would spend 10% of my thousand for 100 euros a month. So it's hitting me a lot harder as a proportion of my income. Uh, okay, so now what happens with that revenue? Let's suppose that we're just the only two people in the economy for 600 euros. If we divided that in an entirely flat way, we would each get 300 euros back, half of the amount, the total amount. Now, what would happen as a net effect is you'd spend 500 and get 300 back, and I'd spend 100 and get 300 back. In other words, in, in this toy example, right, this is not supposed to be represented in numbers, it's nice round numbers, so it's easy to see, you would be transferring 200 euros effectively to me, even though the initial incidence was regressive, we assume that it hits me harder, and even though we didn't necessarily rebate it in any uh, progressive way. Miguel indicated that we could be more progressively sensitive in our redistribution. But in this example, I suppose we just divide it up by the two of us. So this is just a very toy example, but it shows how you, it, things can be progressive, even in the case where they are um, uh, the, in, the initial incidence is regressive, and even though the uh, distribution is flat. And that seems I, I would suppose, I would hope that, I imagine that sounds really surprising, but even in a very simple example, you can see how that happens. And Miguel has shown how that can happen in a larger social way across many different deciles uh, in a slightly more sophisticated way. Okay, but I've talked enough there, so I'll stop. I would like just to add some words, that's okay, uh, Susan, and thank you, Kian. Uh, just, just to highlight the importance of, um, we have to differentiate here the, the issue that carbon taxation as opposed to increasing in, in energy prices, right? Because when you have a, you are facing energy prices as is happening now, that is not any revenue. So this is just losses. Uh, whereas the carbon tax generates this revenue that Kian has pointed out. And I do agree, agree with his point, except for the fact, the fact that um, I do believe in, 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 in helping like uh, fuel allowances as long as it's an assured run solution. And it's clear the transition that we are doing this for the transition. And we 
we, we are using this money with the, with the plan that this money will perhaps disappear when these, these inequalities in, in these uh, capabilities to, to, to substitute energy are uh, there. So when we, we have tackled that through uh, energy efficiency improvements or whatever it is. But I do believe that uh, through the transition, this fairness has to be there. And, and I do uh, believe in, in, and I think you mentioned it as well, Kian, for the short run, uh, the, 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 some measures should be there for, for the short run. And in that uh, case, we, we in, in, in current research, we found that fuel allowance has reduced the, fuel, the, the impact of fuel poverty in, in Ireland. So I, I do believe that this is, is a useful tool, but it has to be used with a plan that uh, we are not keeping the same level of, of maintaining the same level of substitution capabilities. But in fact, we are increasing our ability to reduce uh, our emissions through, through energy efficiency, for example. So that's, that's the two points that I would like to. Thanks so much, um, Miguel. And I, what I'd like to do now is to move to a question that was raised for Orla from our previous panel, but I think actually is quite relevant in terms of what we've listened to on this panel, and particularly, Miguel, the, the comments that you had in relation to the kind of multidimensional nature of inequalities and uh, hierarchical, uh, um, horizontal um, and vertical forms of inequality. So I'm going to come back to this question, if that's okay. And it's, it's asking, how do you weigh the various forms of justice within a climate justice issue? Um, so a transition away from fossil fuel is just in terms of future generations in the global population. However, it might not be just for everyone in Ireland. How can we compare these when the status quo itself is unjust? So again, coming back to that point about unequal starting points. So I'm going to come to Orla and then Miguel, I will invite you if, if, if that's okay to give uh, your thoughts around this particular question. Sure. So I think maybe a useful starting point that that question kind of brings out is that the kind of status quo we're already living in that we lived in pre-COVID, it wasn't perfect. And I think we really need to bring that out. So, um, you know, when we talk about the fossil fuel based society in which we live, there is enormous health impacts from that. I mean, we can talk about it in a global sense, but even within Ireland, if we think of the level of, say, solid fuel burning, the associated really high levels of asthma and respiratory problems, if we think of the quality of homes people live in that are um, being heated by fossil fuels, they're leaky, they're cold. Um, our transport systems, you know, that are built up around uh, private car ownership. So that the quality of life that fossil fuels deliver is not this sort of utopia. So I think that's very important to kind of emphasize um, from the beginning. Um, also, I think it's kind of maybe been brought out a little bit this cost of inaction. Ireland to date has not really felt the impacts of climate change in a very pronounced way but that is yes that is relative luck and as the impacts of climate worsen globally within Europe that will have huge knock-on impacts in Ireland you know in terms of food security so I think those that's kind of a very important picture to to start with but then I think it's important to I suppose foreground that and I, this came out in a brilliant um a uh, report by Sean McCabe as part of a uh, task that we are kind of tackling climate and taking climate action in circumstances where there isn't huge um, social buy into climate action itself, mostly because people are just really concerned with, you know, cost of living issues with the end of the month kinds of issues. So I think what we need to do in and this is maybe coming back to the point I tried to bring out in my presentation when we're trying to integrate climate justice and just transition into everything it's actually about building climate policies that um, make people's lives better and so even you know and I know this is a debate in sort of uh, discussions about whether or not public transport should be entirely free even if that you know the the, the cost associated is, is, is not seen to be, you know, commensurate with the, the emission reductions. That is something that improves people's quality of life. And so that, is, that creates that important social buy-in. So I think looking at um, measures that improve people's quality of life and reduce emissions is really important. And that also speaks to retrofitting, you know, um, in Ireland to date, our retrofitting scheme, it's mostly um, accessible to people from quite wealthy backgrounds already. Um, even anecdotally, if I talk to my friends, nobody is anywhere near looking at uh, retrofitting. So I think, you know, looking at actually how do we do this in a way that improves everybody's lives? I mean, even initially, so another European country subject to the similar 
um, EU rules, like they have rolled out um, 110% uh, retrofit grants there. So there is, I think, ways of um, doing these policies in a way that really brings people along. And that's so important. And I think that tackles kind of the social justice part and takes climate action. So I hope that kind of answers that question. Orla. And Miguel, I wonder if I could ask for your input to that. Yes, I would like to start saying that um, I, I thank you all of you again, because I, I learned quite a lot uh, during these presentations. And coming back to that question to say that measuring is one part of the solution, right? It's, it's important to keep track of the, the measures, but it's not the only thing that we have to consider. When you ask me about how to weigh these things, it's very, it's very tricky because you in your presentation talk about identity, talks about um, need for representation that we cannot quantify with our models, right? We cannot say what is the way to go in, in, in that dimension. So I do appreciate the, the multidimensional aspects and uh, the, 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 the collaboration between different, uh, among different disciplines to have an idea of the real impact of the policies. So it's a, it's a tricky question to say, because it, I, I don't want to boil everything to say, boil down to say that it's, it's about measuring, because it's not. Uh, as an economist, we can provide some answers to some questions, but not for all. And that's where all the collaboration comes into play. Yeah. Thanks so much, Miguel, for a lovely, lovely inclusive response. Um, so I want to move on. We have two minutes or one minute left, uh, and I want to move on to the, a really important question that has been raised by Paddy Gaynor. Um, and it was a question I actually had also in relation to the kind of comparability keen within your presentation of the COVID experience and carbon taxation and that focus on pro sociability. Um, so Paddy articulates it far better than I could. And he says, thanks so much for an excellent presentation. But while there's research highlighted desire of Irish citizens for climate action in a general sense, this often does not appear to be the case in local examples of land use change, such as pedestrianisation, afforestation, wind farms, etc. And this often highlights tensions in relation to multi-scalar um, multi power inequalities. And so he asks, you know, how do we reconcile the need for action with a lack of consensus that is not evident, uh, uh, or lack of consensus on that local scale? So Keen, if I can come to you, and then Miguel, I'll give you the final word also, um, if that's okay. Thanks so much, Susan, and thank you, Patty, for, for an excellent question um, and, and really well put. Um, and unfortunately, this is the case in many jurisdictions that there is a general um, uh, agreement that we need a, a, a green transition, a just transition, that we need climate action, but often that is conjoined with um, uh, limited uh, local um, uh, local limited agreement on on exactly the means that would be needed to to meet that. Um, so I have to say that. Uh, I don't have an easy answer here. Um, I think that this is difficult. Um, but what it does point to is the uh, very familiar um, idiom, uh, uh, think globally, act locally, which is that when we are trying to address large scale problems, um, we might feel um, uh, it might, might feel unsatisfying or it might even feel overwhelming. Um, but the actual change happens in uh, bottom up, uh, as it was mentioned earlier, um, often on often smaller um, components of a larger um, activity. So um, that I actually think means that the emphasis should be on the ways that engaging in your community and engaging in smaller projects, whether those are pedestrianization, whether those are uh, wind farms and, and, and against NIMBYism, those things have to be part of you can make a difference, right? So when we're talking about climate change, a lot of people are uh, subject to uh, despair or, 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 or succumb to despair or, or disillusionment. Um, and I think that when you bring it back to local examples, the message um, can be or should be um, that that's actually the way that we make differences and we make our small contributions to what is a massive problem that requires a lot of uh, uh, contribution. Now, some people might not see that, um, but I think that that is the way to motivate people to act. But I, I don't think it's easy. Um, and I think that you're right to, to push on that as a difficulty. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kian. And Miguel, I'd like to come to you just for the final, your final comments uh, in about 30 seconds, if you could. Thanks. Yeah, just uh, again, uh, trying to highlight the different aspects of this is, is very important. We saw that from education to uh, political participation, law, and also uh, some aspects of 
ethical core of ethical are very important and shouldn't be neglected. And I'm sure there are other aspects as well that at the time and for the construction, we are not able to speak here, but there are different aspects that should be considered to engage uh, the population and not only to accept policies that uh, make for, for the just transition. So I'd like to take this opportunity to say an enormous thank you to Miguel and to Kian um, for your presentations and Orna for jumping in to give that response as well. I know we have some additional questions, but hopefully we'll be able to get to those as we move into our final section as well, because I think that they're relevant for our final panelists also. And so with that, we're going to move into our third section today, which is the panel discussion. And Miguel, I think you're going to kick us off, if, if I'm correct, um, yes. um, in this section. So thanks, Miguel. Thank you, Susan. Uh, just to, to mention our plan for this uh, uh, panel. So we'll have, uh, I'm gonna introduce first our, uh, our panelists, which I have to thank you again for their participation. Then after that, we'll make a general um, comment from the literature and see what is the reaction from our panelists to that. Then the next part is gonna be Susan, which is gonna, she's gonna ask some specific questions on, on, on the, queries that we have on, on, on the particular aspects of the, the, the activities that our presenters, our panels are, are, are involved in. So that could be, and then after that, uh, Susan will collect some questions from the audience based on all of this uh, debate. So let me start then uh, introducing our, our panelists. So we have uh, John Fitzgerald. He's a adjunct professor in economics at Trinity College. He's also a former uh, researcher professor at the ESRI. He's also a member of the Climate Change Advisory Council. So thank you very much, uh, John. Then we have uh, Saif O'Neill. She's a lecturer and researcher in cl climate policies, uh, uh, climate politics and policy at DCU. Uh, and she's also the lead uh, author of a very interesting report called uh, Environmental Justice in Ireland. So she will uh, tell us a bit of this uh, report later on. And then, uh, sorry if I, is pronounced your last name, Frank, is Frank Mahon. Uh, he's a principal officer in the Just, uh, uh, in the just, uh, just Transition team. Uh, I hope this is uh, from the Department of uh, Environment and Climate and Communication. Uh, climate, sorry, he's the principal uh, officer in the Climate Action team of the Department of Environment, uh, Climate and Communication. Sorry for that. So uh, let me start from the first um, uh, question uh, that I have for our panelists. Uh, so this is taken from uh, August Deaton, which is, uh, he, he is a Nobel Prize in economics, who was the, the Nobel Prize of economics, I think, uh, three years ago. And he, uh, quoting his work, he said, it is a tragedy that mainstream economies have mostly lost touch with philosophy and with the ethical basis for what they do. And I would like to start uh, asking John uh, his uh, first reactions uh, to that. John, if, if you can give us some uh, your comments on this. All right, uh, uh, tackling climate change um, is essentially an ethical problem. It's a big problem for the, the um, uh, political system. Most politicians have an ethical basis for what they're doing, but they don't like going out and talking ethics. and Politicians normally go to people and say, vote for me and I'll make you better off. Whereas actually on climate change, they've got to go to people and say, you're going to be worse off, but your great grandchildren are going to be much better off. Difficult sell. And um, in terms of scientists, actually, the most difficult audience I've had to talk to was uh, the local Catholic parish um, uh, to talk about the ethics. So it is difficult to talk ethics, but I felt that Alan Barrett was actually unfair to the ESRI and the, where Angus Deaton was talking about the US. Um, uh, Ireland is different. In the ESRI in the 1980s, Damien Hannan, the late Damien Hannan sociologist, cared passionately about uh, deprivation and poverty in Ireland. He put two together a team of eco sociologists, economists under Brian Nolan and so psychologists under Chris Whelan, which developed a technology and has influenced how Europe measures poverty and has had a huge impact on policy in Ireland. So it was the ethical basis for choosing the research topic. And spin off from that was the work by Sue Scott in 1992 or, and over 20 years in terms of climate change. She showed that people on low incomes were going to be most affected by measures and that you, how you could protect them. 
and Miguel, your work and that of Mirren and Kelly and others in the SRI today, there's 30 years the SRI has cared about this. They have done the research on it and they have shown how we can deal with it. So Angus Deaton is right about the US, but he is not right about Ireland. Um, and it is not economists working on their own, I would emphasize. It was sociologists, economists, psychologists in that team which showed the way. So um, um, in terms of the just transition itself, um, um, it, 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 the international literature is very much on coal miners are going to lose jobs. What do you do about that? And that's an ethical issue. Actually, in Ireland, the number of direct job losses is small. That's not the issue. Um, Susan focused on, uh, and they're not employees, on farmers and treating them with respect and finding the solution. I think the government have, in terms of the targets they've set for Ireland, they got it wrong. Um, and it is creating a, a, a potential battle between the agricultural community and climate change, which is unnecessary. Um, but the big area in Ireland is people on low incomes. Um, and what's different, the technology that we've looked at it so far, and uh, already um, I think that um, uh, uh, Miguel, um, or was it um, uh, Kian mentioned it, uh, um, actually no, it was Orla, um, that in terms of tackling the change, if you, when you come to ret retrofitting, um, people on low incomes can't afford the capital cost of undertaking it. So we've looked at using welfare systems targeted to protect people, but actually we need to think about are there capital measures that need to be taken? And the final thing, just if I could go back to what Orla talked about, I am concerned. I believe I live in a democracy, a parliamentary democracy, and the issue of what is fair and redistribution is for politicians. It is not to be contracted out to a just transition commission or to regulators. And I've been 10 years on the board of the Central Bank and four years on the Northern Ireland Authority for Energy Regulation. And one of the reasons for financial disaster was the contracting out of too many things to the Central Bank. Their objectives were unclear in the 2000s. And when I was nor on the Northern Ireland Authority for Energy Regulation, we were, our job legally was to provide a secure and low cost electricity supply for people of Northern Ireland and to deal with climate change. And that was a huge problem because if we dealt with climate change, we were going to raise the cost of electricity affecting poor people. And that was not a job for a regulator. It is a job for the political system. And the Just Transition Commission a lot of the roles which people talk about for it is a job for the politicians and the Oireachtas Committee. It should not be contracted out to the courts. And the Supreme Court itself, which understands the Constitution, has resisted being put in a position of deciding what's fair. That's for politicians. Thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, is uh, any other comment following from this from our panelists, uh, Saif or, or Frank? Do you have any additional comments on this? I'd like to make a comment, if that's okay, Miguel. Um, well, just to, to, to firstly concur in a way with, with, with John Fitzgerald there, I think the SRI has done tremendous work in applying what we might call an engaged ethics approach, uh, using the tools of economics and social policy to contribute to policy formation. And uh, I think that's a very, very important role that econ economics can play in public policy formation. Um, however, I suppose some of the criticisms that are implied by that quote, even if they don't apply directly to Ireland as much as the US, suggest that that you know that there's something kind of faulty with the approach that economists uh, use in looking at climate policy. Um, one example of that is, I mean, and this is a huge discussion, I suppose, the kind of ethical basis for looking at models, the um, uh, assumptions that are built into models, choices of discount rate, for example, assumptions about human behavior that often just don't play out in reality. And the, the kind of assumptions that are made a lot of the time about the willingness or even ability of governments to uh, uh, address market failures and other externalities in the economy that limit the capacity of the economy as a whole to respond to certain incentives like a, a carbon pricing mechanism. But one of the things that I just wanted to mention 
that I think is becoming increasingly important because I don't think this is a long term issue. We're not talking about great grandchildren here. We're talking about our direct descendants. You know, people who are alive today are going to experience potentially devastating and catastrophic climate impacts. And what's never sort of uh, allowed for in the discussion, at least as it's framed in economic terms, is the question of sacrifice or there is no possibility of any loss of welfare. And that seems to me to be an extraordinary uh, blind spot in economics, that we have to build uh, everything around a model that assumes growth and that doesn't implicitly build in a recognition of planetary boundaries. And the fact that as we approach these limits to growth, that um, the, uh, the, the, the changes that are going to be required of us all and of economics um, will be massive. There'll be a potentially very disruptive transition. So when we're talking here about the policies and measures for a smooth transition, we're kind of taking our eye off what might be more realistic or at least a scenario that we ought to prepare for, which is a much more uh, bumpy ride, I think, in, into the future. And finally, I'd just like to, to say that one of the other um, things that doesn't get discussed much and notwithstanding and I think the SRI has played in a really really valuable role in public policy in Ireland especially around climate change and the distributive impact of climate policies but it's the potential for economics to assert a kind of veto role so you know because of the sort of privileged position that economists have in public policy both within government and as you know elite outside experts um, you have what uh, Jonathan Aldred calls veto economics, the idea that, you know, if anything can be described as inefficient or irrational or anti-competitive, it just gets ruled out. And we never get to talk about, you know, creative solutions. And uh, an example of that uh, would be something that Diane Coyle said. She's an economist who was writing for the English Independent. She says, where common sense and economics conflict, common sense is wrong. And, you know, that kind of arrogance is... Uh, perhaps, um, you know, not representative of econ e economists generally, but I think it speaks to a sort of a privileged position that economists often take in public policy, which I think is problematic because as you've shown in your, in your own work, um, what we need is a much more interdisciplinary approach. This needs to be a team effort and no one discipline uh, has the last say on the matter. Thank you, Saif. Uh, I do agree in that part, but also I would say that um, the, the role of economists using um, tools from philosophy is more kind of, um, it, what I'm trying to say is it's not a methodological connection. And, and that's where uh, I think it's important, the, the, the communication across different disciplines. And hopefully this is a good starting point and we, have, we can have this tradition at the ESRI holding these events where we have different uh, professions uh, talking about the, this uh, important issue, which is climate change. Um, so I wonder if you have any comments on this, uh, uh, Frank, or should we go to the next uh, question? Yeah, maybe just to come in very, uh, very quickly, just from the role of the kind of the policy system and, and, and policy making in, in this piece. I mean, I think certainly from the point of view of, of climate policy, It'll be well recognised now in in the Irish system that 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 policy needs to be informed not not only by economics and that there's a range of other disciplines that are being brought to bear and need to be brought to bear to to inform policy development. Um, you know, from sociology, from um, uh, from geography, right the way through a range of academic disciplines, um, and as well as that's a recognition that sort of the the question of policy design has moved very much now from the question of what do we need to do to to how do we do that um, and while you know the role of carbon pricing has certainly a very long history in, as, as as a kind of a key key mechanism for delivering on on our climate uh, mitigation objectives in the irish policy context I, I think it's been kind of clear and recognized for for some time that that is only one of a number of different types of mechanisms different types of policy mechanisms that need to be brought to bear alongside things like regulation, um, subsidies, um, and um, di direct investment, um, but also recognizing that the uh, the actors uh, that we need to, to look to and to address are not only individuals, are not only um, the state, it's, it's a range of, of, of actors throughout 
throughout society and throughout the economy and the relationship between those actors is also key uh, and how the perspective and the roles of one influences influences the other uh, i think as we've been trying to approach policy design we've been um, looking very much at how um, how policy can help to influence behavioral choices behavioral changes um, whether that's in terms of providing uh, public charging infrastructure for electric vehicles or whether it's in terms of um, removing obstacles for for individuals to take to to invest in rooftop rooftop solar for example in terms of planning permission exemptions or or providing a you know a tariff uh, for, for people to 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 install and to actually get a get a revenue from it so does that relationship between individual action and state action is, is very very important and and gets gets to the question of of policy design i think very uh very uh, very centrally in terms of how we approach everything thanks thank you frank i, I just want to uh what uh professor stephen uh, Gardner, in that regard that you are talking about individual and state responsibilities. So he basically, uh, in one, in one of his book, which is very interesting, the, it's called The Perfect Moral Storm, the Ethical Tragedy of Climate Change. He said that there is a risk that the individual could discharge responsibilities by transferring them to their institutions. And he thinks that uh, one important challenge is identifying this, uh, our, identifying our collective and individual responsibilities, because as you, uh, you mentioned in, in your comments, it's not only about um, our institutions or our technology. It really implies an involvement of individuals as well in trying to, to do the transition. Thank you for that. So um, the, the next part of this is gonna be uh, Susan uh, asking a specific questions on their activities that you are uh, involved in your, in your professions. So if you want to start Susan with these questions. Yes, thanks, Miguel. And I'd also just like to remind our participants that we are keeping a close eye on the QA function. So if you do have any questions, please do pop them in there. Uh, one or two questions have come through and I've kind of figured out where I can integrate them into the into the questions that we have here. So if, if it's okay with everyone, I'd like to, to kick off um, with a, a couple of questions for you, John. Uh, you know, given the leadership role that you've had in this space um, over the last number of years, um, I wonder if you could share with us your thoughts around how we can match cost effectiveness with equity in the transition. Uh, and I'm thinking, I, I suppose specifically in relation to the, the, the work that's been done in the Irish context, but really more broadly, any comments you would have in relation to that would be fantastic. Thanks, John. Um, that's a, a, a difficult question. I, 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 our target is to reach net zero by 2050, and how do we do that in a cost-effective way? And I rely a lot on the research done by, for example, UCC Marai, um, um, also by Chagask, and one of and and work done with the University of Limerick um, as well. Um, so we rely on the science, and what the science tells us is there is a huge opportunity to suck carbon out of the atmosphere through forestry. That I think it, it, our total emissions of carbon dioxide between now and 2030, or 2035, our budget is 400 euro mi million tons. That um, uh, 100 to 200 million could be sucked out by 2050 by forestry. Um, that's cost effective. The, the government in their public expenditure guidelines values carbon in 2050 at 265 euros a ton. That's a 25 to 50 billion gain for Ireland if we tackle that problem. So, and the problem there is not the farmers. The problem is the regulatory system. Um, so there are ways in which Ireland can actually make a major contribution and in particular what Susan focused, but you focused on the role of the agricultural sector give them the opportunity to make a big contribution and they could make a really big contribution but the regulatory system is getting in the way of making progress so they're really cost effective that's something which will actually save ireland money not cost ireland money and make a big difference so i think it is look at the science look at the engineering work and um, um, and build on that economists I can't give you that information. And it's why we have to work in a multidisciplinary environment, which I must say, I find it fun working with engineers and sociologists and whatever. Um, 
Thanks. Thanks so much, John. And just to kind of follow on that point that you raised around the challenges with the regulatory system, you know, from, from your perspective, do you think both markets and the existing institutional instruments are ready for that fair allocation of transition costs? So um, are, are we ready or what types of changes would you suggest we need to see in place? I think we need a combination. Like carbon tax is only a beginning to the price right. But Laudato C, I don't know whether you read the Pope's encyclical, which was addressed not just to believers, to unbelievers, was very eloquent on the ethics, but he didn't really believe in markets in a number of cases. And can I give one example of why markets are important? I don't know whether you noticed, there were no tomatoes in the shops for two weeks in April. And the reason was there was a strike in Spain because of the Ukraine war and the cost of carbon. And the only tomatoes coming in were from Italy. And the reason they came from Italy was because the cost of gas has gone up so much that where we would normally get our tomatoes from the Netherlands, from greenhouses heated with gas, um, it was too expensive. And gas wasn't expensive enough from the price point of view of the price of carbon. And actually it was cheaper to import tomatoes from Italy and it was less damaging to the environment than using gas to heat uh, greenhouses in Ireland or the Netherlands. And um, now they've come through because glass houses in, without heating in Ireland and the Netherlands can produce our tomatoes uh, in, in May and June. But I think that was interesting. Inst so instead of going out and focusing on uh, uh, what tomatoes should I buy if I want to be uh, do least damage to the environment, the price actually showed buy Italian tomatoes rather than buying Dutch tomatoes. Um, uh, uh, now, it'll be better uh, probably not buy any tomatoes um, and just stick to carrots, but um, that, that, that's, that's a different matter. So markets are important and signals, but it is all, it's only a beginning. Um, and um, I, I, I think Ian has already uh, talked about that. And from an institutional perspective, would you have any kind of insights, comments, again, kind of, proposals around the different types of institutional structures or instruments that need to be in place to facilitate this? I think changing institutions puts like the movement of responsibility for climate, and I saw this directly, from the Custom House to Adelaide Road, put back climate change policy by two years. So um, the, the, the new department had to learn what it was going to do. So work with the institutions you've Got and make and and make them work rather than creating new institutions. And um, also, I have a serious concern that we have spent so much time on climate law and the carbon budgets and now on the sector targets that government has actually not done anything. Like it hasn't dealt with the forestry issue, which was clear two years ago. So concentrating on legislation rather than on actually implementing policies that will make climate change. Like I know on the Climate Change Advisory Council all our time went into the carbon budgets rather than telling the government you should get the, get the finger out and start doing things. And um, so I think that it, rather than looking for institutional changes, make use of the institutions and make them work. And they haven't been working very well because the office has been totally tied up with legislation rather than with actually making us change. Thank you, John, for the bold, bold comments. Um, and I do want to make sure that Frank um, and Sai, if you'd like to kind of reflect or comment on either of those questions or indeed respond to John, please do feel free to, to jump in there. Uh, Saiv, I noticed you've come off mute, so I'll hand over to you first. Um, I, I, I would share some of um, uh, John's concern that we're moving too slowly, and, and that's evident from the latest uh, EPA uh, figures for Ireland's greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and, there, and, and, and coupled with that, there is a lag effect. So any policies that are introduced take some time to take effect and uh, sort of ripple throughout the economy. Um, but I, I, I would also say that the governance framework, which was absent for the last 10, 15 years in kind of uh, driving Ireland's climate agenda, um, was a really significant barrier to progress. It was a significant policy barrier. It created all kinds of loopholes and people essentially in different sectors sort of did what they wanted to do because there was no, nothing or nobody to tell them otherwise. 
um, there was a, a very insufficient and inadequate um, accountability mechanism, which is very well corrected, I think, in the new climate law. So there were these are these were kind of necessary but not sufficient measures to get us back on track. Um, however, we're not on track. So we, we have to take John's point uh, at face value. We have policies in place that are not being implemented. And I do feel that a lot of the emphasis that went towards improving the governance agenda hasn't necessarily translated into obvious political and cultural change. We have strong uh, commitments in the program for government, but it is questionable. And I think this is something that came up through in one of the questions or a couple of the questions to the degree to which there is genuine public buy-in for some of those measures. And that's something we have to pay careful attention to. Um, so the ESRI has done a lot of behavioral research as has the EPA on kind of public attitudes to uh, climate action. And while it always seems to find a strong latent demand for climate policies, which is reassuring and a strong you know, latent awareness of climate change as a sort of scientific problem that must be addressed. There's no, no question of that. It, it doesn't translate into the kind of, yes, let's get on with this right now and let's make the sacrifices or let's make the changes that are necessary. Um, so I think there is a missing piece there. Um, there is a missing piece about how to mobilize and engage the public. And that has something to do with public participation in the policy making process, the kind of issues that you were talking about earlier with the, with the uh, beef farmers research that you did, Susan. But I think it also, Leads to a kind of uh, depoliticization of the climate agenda at, at a local level. So if you were to look at people's voting intentions or political preferences or the kind of uh, political discourse that happens in the Oireachtas or at local authority level, I suspect we would find it really wanting for a, a depth and analysis of, of climate policy. And uh, there isn't really, in, in, in my view, uh, a very high level of interrogation of climate policy, besides the work that went on um, during the uh, process of adopting the new climate law. When it comes to the climate policies, the opposition are nervous about tying themselves into a corner, and the government often doesn't get interrogated uh, in, in a way that would drive ambition, but it seems to suggest that, in fact, we need to be pulling in the opposite direction, you know, which is catering to kind of the fears of you know, the public or certain political constituencies. Um, and, and, and in this sense, I, I, I agree actually very much with John. I think we you need, do need to be very careful not to um, farm out this issue as an inconvenience to certain institutions and say, well, let's just give it to the equivalent of the central bank to sort out because you clearly can't get a political consensus on this. I think without a political consensus, you do not have the trust you do not have the political legitimacy and you do, uh, don't have that kind of long term uh, cultural change that that we desperately need to see. Um, having said that, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm painting everybody with the same brush here. I'm not targeting any one particular group because I think it's a complex issue in our political culture and it's going to take time uh, to tweak. We, we're, I think we're, we're not sure who's playing what role in this debate. Who are the leaders? Who are the policy innovators? Who are the drivers and agents of change? And, um, you know, I think that's going to take some time to come to the fore. But of course, we don't have the time. So we all need to step up right now. <laughs> Thanks so much, Saeed. And I think, um, I mean, I, I do think there is a balance between the recognition to have that deep deliberative engagement. It's not just about pandering to fears, it is also about very much listening to what are the issues that this will give rise to. And I think that that's certainly that was the, that's the piece of research that has emerged very strong for ourselves. It's not about inaction or delaying action, but it is about actually engaging with communities to understand why we're going to see different types of resistance. And that can happen potentially in parallel with action, as well as looking for the types of solutions that might be much more place appropriate. So I think that that's, you know, that's going to be an interesting conversation, I think, particularly in the afforestation space that John referred to, given, you know, the, the, the renewed focus um, on, on afforestation practices. And um, Frank, can I just ask you if you have any comments in relation to this discussion? Um, I, I absolutely don't want to exclude you and you will be well positioned, I'm sure, uh, to share some insights on this. Thanks, thanks, Susan. Yeah, I mean, look at what 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 Simon John have touched on. Uh, there's a, there's a huge amount of complexity to to the discussion, and, and a lot of threads have kind of come come to the fore there in terms of, um, you know, a lot of the influences on on the design and implementation of climate policy. Um, I, I would certainly, um, you know, 
refer back to John's earlier point about the kind of the role of the Oireachtas and, and, the, and the primacy of the Oireachtas in terms of in terms of driving this. Um, you know, the Oireachtas has determined that you know there should be a climate law, a strengthened climate law uh, through the twenty twenty one Act, and you know the governance um, and review structures that that come with that law. Um, so, uh, uh, as an expression of the will of the Oireachtas, it, it's clear that. It has seen that there is there are, are, are gaps in in governance and that there are gaps uh, as a result in implementation, um, and those gaps have have now been filled and are being fleshed out through the carbon budgets process and through the sectoral emission ceilings, which are um, currently being being finalised by 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 the minister. Um, another kind of strand that was touched on is is I suppose the relationship between. Uh, individuals and and politicians uh, and this question I think Sai put it very well is like who actually leads who who takes a leadership role in this is it is it individuals or is it the political system and this is a I suppose a long running kind of discussion uh, within within I suppose you know um, Irish political culture but but particularly within climate policy is that there's a sense that at a very very high level. There is very strong buy-in for the need for climate action, and we've seen that in, in what the Oireachtas has done. Um, but we also see it in terms of um, public sentiment surveys that have been undertaken by the likes of the Environmental Protection Agency. That there's a strong commitment and willingness to act on climate. But when it get when you get down to particular issues, uh, and this refers back to one of the questions from from the audience earlier, is that there can often be quite strong resistance to uh, action at, at a local level or action that actually impacts on, on, on individuals. Um, and where there is, is the relationship between individuals and the political system, um, is that functioning? Is that working the way it should? Is the political system providing the leadership it needs to provide? Um, is that somehow hampering implementation? So there's, there's a lot of issues to unpick in that. And I think, you know, as 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 colleagues have said, this is a long term agenda, and we're still kind of working through how to how to push it forward, and it's continually evolving. Thanks. Thanks so much, Frank. I think they're really helpful um, insights. Now, with your permission, I'd like to just move uh, move our conversation forward um, somewhat. And so, I would like to to talk to you, you know, as somebody who's been working and thinking and speaking and researching in around the area of climate and environmental justice for for a long time. I wonder, would you be able to kind of help us pinpoint some of the key dimensions of environmental and climate injustices from your research? Thank you very much, uh, Susan. I put the link to the report that we wrote uh, in the chat box there for anyone to have a look at. And um, just to say a little bit about this project, it was um, a project funded by the IRC, the Irish Research Council under its new foundations um, program. So it was a kind of joint activity between DCU, Centre for Climate and Society, uh, led by my colleague, Dear McTorney, and CLM, which is Community Law and Mediation, which is a, a, a charity that works with vulnerable and marginalized communities offering free legal aid and other services as well. So it was a really, really interesting project because what we wanted to look at was environmental justice specifically. And while the report does talk a little bit about just transition and climate justice, we were specifically interested in exploring dimensions of environmental injustice because obviously that covers a range of potential indicators and impacts that are that might be slightly unrelated to climate change per se, although everything is connected ultimately. We're looking at issues like water pollution, uh, uh, air pollution and health, uh, fuel poverty, which is obviously connected to the climate change debate and um, and many other indicators, waste management and also access to information and participation and procedural justice. So th this is an interesting uh, topic for Ireland because it's been really well documented in the United States for a long number of decades that there is a, a direct correlation between the distribution of environmental burdens of pollution and certain socioeconomic groups and even racial minorities in the United States. And when that information was uncovered and documented and quantified, it led to, uh, I suppose, a growth of a new social movement built around understanding the complexity of, of pollution and socioeconomic and even racial discrimination. So it's this kind of intersection 
of uh, pollution and class and racism that drove this new movement, which was somewhat different in how it um, went about uh, advocacy to the mainstream environmental movement of the United States. So it, 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 you know, it's a very interesting story in its own right. And following from that work uh, led by uh, Bullard in the United States and, and others, um, similar research projects were done uh, in other countries, but it's never really been done in Ireland. So we undertook this project as a kind of very uh, basic sort of survey of what was available in terms of information. And as part of the project, we also um, held some workshops uh, with community groups that would be representative of marginalized communities. And here, this is one of the places where it's important to distinguish between geographical communities and sort of other types of groups who, for whatever reason, are, uh, are isolated or excluded. And they included, for example, representatives of, of older people, uh, of the traveler communities, and um, and uh, I'm trying to think, and, and also, you know, charities that work uh, and have expertise in policy terms working with uh, social disadvantage. So it's a very, very interesting cross section um, that we spoke to. And the overriding message we got back from them, which was backed up in the research, was that this is a really uh, underexplored topic in Ireland, that nobody really knows what level of pollution their community is suffering. There's a lack of awareness of the kind of relationship between pollution and say health burdens or you know, access to public services like transport or whatever. And that there's a lack of kind of joined up thinking in how these policies are designed so that the uh, potential to uh, eliminate po poverty and disadvantage is kind of factored in to the way we roll out public services. So um, this, from our point of view, we defined environmental justice as and it touches on the kind of uh, uh, framework that you, you yourself were speaking about uh, with, the, with the beef plan project. Um, we looked at it through three lenses, but they all have to be considered together. So firstly, you've got the distributive land. So where is the pollution? Who's experiencing it in geographical terms? And this is a mapping exercise. There's a lot of data there available from hopefully the, the most recent census uh, in conjunction with the work done by Prashka and others to uh, look at small areas and kind of select data that can tell you uh, where where the poverty is, where the unemployment is, where the social disadvantage is, and we know where the pollution is. There's plenty of data. There could be more, but we certainly have enough to be getting on with. But there's no research really to tell us uh, on, on a national level what the burden of pollution is. So various researchers from the health sciences have looked at the impact of uh, air pollution in certain communities, particularly in Dublin City, relating it to hospital admissions, but we don't have a national profile. We don't have uh, information about the exposure of children to air pollution, for example, and we don't have exposure uh, uh, data that tells us about in detail about the socio-economic um, um, relationship to transport, public transport provision. Um, we just take it as a given that these things are the way they are in Ireland and we never interrogate them and, and, and uh, ask whether this is acceptable or whether this is a fair uh, way to spend public money or to, to, to roll out public services. So the second um, area is the procedural dimension. And this is the question of the legal frameworks, access to justice, access to information. And how easy is it to defend the environment, defend or take actions in defense of the environment or in, de in defense of a community? And of course, in Ireland, you know, we have a very, very uh, costly um, uh, legal framework for taking environmental cases. And in fact, I, I won't speak any more about that because that's really Orla Kelleher's area. So perhaps she might come in at some point and, and speak to that. And the third area is of course the recognition and identity, which looks at the question of the particular impacts on certain social groups that may or may not be geographical. So you're looking at the particular environmental burdens on very young people, very young children exposed to air pollution, or indeed uh, heat stress as it might be experienced by older people uh, can be much more serious. Um, in addition to that, you know, there's plenty of research now available showing that traveler and migrant communities uh, experience a range of um, discrimination and lack of public services, very uh, limited access to public space, uh, very poor environmental quality, even during the COVID 
uh, lack of running water and basic services. So all of these have to be understood as environmental quality, dimensions of environmental quality. And if you don't have those basic rights met, um, it's very difficult to expect people to want to engage in you know, measures to protect or enhance biodiversity or getting involved yeah. in, in, in climate action. Yeah. So those are the kind of three dimensions of environmental justice. Thanks so much and congratulations to you and your colleagues at DCU for really interesting research and indeed I would encourage anybody to engage with the uh, with the published work uh, um, to, to explore this area further and to get a better to get a deeper understanding in the, the three dimensions we talk about. Um, sadly we have just about run out of time and I have to apologize but I do have one final question and this question is one that actually came up by uh, from Dr Jean Moore earlier on in the conversation and is also tied in with an area that we were hoping that Frank could lead our discussion around. Around. And that, and it also, I think, um, Saif, you've kind of touched on this point already, and it's to do with the main gaps in data and analysis needed to implement effective just transition policies. So um, Jean's question was really, you know, what are what types of indicators should we be using? So Frank, if you could think about or just maybe share with us in one to two minutes, and then I think we need to call proceedings to, I'll have to hand back to Miguel and we need to call proceedings to an end. But if you could share with us the, the, the main gaps that, as you see them and potential indicators that we need to be thinking about building into our um, um, implementation and um, monitoring and evaluation um, of uh, just transition policies. Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Thanks very much, Susan. And, and Jean's question actually touches on, on something that we've kind of recognised, I think, in, in the Climate Action Plan that was published last year, which was that there is a need to develop indicators for to 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 uh, I suppose track and measure progress and implementation of of uh, climate policies to help ensure just transition. Um, and I suppose the question there becomes, you know, what through what dimension should we would should we be looking at this and through what lenses should we be looking at this? And I think what Saif has just presented in terms of the research that uh, has been undertaken presents a very kind of uh, detailed kind of uh, uh, look at kind of the various uh, dimensions of, 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 you know, environmental indicators that are relevant to climate policy and touch on some of, you know, both the uh, kind of co-detriments, but also the co-benefits of implementing climate policy. There are very, very real uh, impacts in terms of health outcomes that um, are linked to uh, implementing climate policies across various dimensions. For example, impacts on air quality, uh, well recognised uh, in terms of fossil fuel usage. So there's, you know, so many different kind of ways you can actually look at this. Uh, but coming a little bit back then to, I suppose, the uh, the questions that uh, that Orla presented in her presentation around the uh, the the way uh, just transition is treated in legislation and how that has been given kind of further articulation in the climate action plan, you know, we're very much looking at the the question of uh, you know. Uh, Making sure that there's that there's a, an, an employment benefit to the transition, uh, that people have the right skills that we uh, seek to ensure an equitable impact uh, of the implementation of climate policies, and that we uh, address this in 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 a participative way through through social dialogue. And here, the role of the national dialogue and climate action uh, comes to the fore. Uh, but you can look at this then through, uh, I suppose, a number of different dimensions and thinking. Of, you know indicators but also the underpinning data that you might need um looking to you know what are the occupations likely to be adversely impacted but also what are the emerging industries and occupations and skill sets that might be needed and there's been good work already done by the likes of the expert for the future skills needs in this space um i think the spatial dimension is very important we haven't really touched on that in a huge way uh, this morning um, not looking not only looking at the kind of the the variety of uh, of impacts across different regions, but um, but going going down to a much a much more local area. So I've touched on the kind of the small area data sets in in, in presentation that uh, or the research you presented just now. So you know uh, there are there are various spatial scales you can look at this, um, and uh, NESC have have done a lot of work recently in looking at the uh, the spatial dimension to to just transition. Uh, and I think it's also important not to forget the the whole area of um, resilience and, and climate adaptation policies and the the importance way in which 
in which the way we you know look to adapt to what is going to be inevitable climate change into the future um, is, is done in such a way as to recognize that people will have different capacities to to adapt to to become climate resilient uh, and, and that has to be kind of uh, to be worked up in terms of in terms of uh, data and analysis as well so so just a whistle stop tour through the various aspects there thanks very much Susan Thanks so much, Frank. I think that was really, really concise um, and you covered uh, some really important critical issues there. Um, I want to say an enormous thank you to the panel for your um, for responding to all of those queries and thanks to the audience for sharing your questions. And Miguel, I'm going to hand back to you to close out our session. And I do apologize for running a couple of minutes over time. No, thank you very much. Uh, just to uh, congratulate all the people that participate and, and excellent presentations, everybody, uh, with the presenters and the panels, uh, panelists, uh, and everybody to thank you. And hopefully, as I said, this will be hopefully the beginning of a tradition where all of these professions come together and speak about this uh, complex topic. Thank you very much.